Volume Three, Chapter Four, Part One, of the Mummy: A Tale of the Twenty Second Century. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Mummy: A Tale of the Twenty Second Century by Jane Loudon. Volume Three, Chapter Four, Part One. In the meantime. Lord Edmund's mind was tortured by the bitterest anguish, and his agitation, added to the pain of his wounds, produced a considerable degree of fever. The conduct of Elvira, and the anxiety she had evinced respecting the prince, seemed to confirm his worst suspicions. "'Oh, God! Oh, God!' cried he, as he paced his prison in agony. "'I could have borne anything but this. It is too, too much!' by heaven i could sell myself to everlasting perdition to be revenged as he spoke he heard the key of his dungeon door grate in the lock and he shuddered for he almost fancied some hideous sceptre would appear in answer to his call and he felt indescribably relieved when he heard the gentle insinuating tones of father morris sweet is the voice of friendship to the disappointed spirit and soft falls the balm of consolation from those we love upon the wounded heart. Edmund's bosom thus throbbed with transport when he saw the reverend father, and throwing his arms round his neck, he sobbed like a child. "'My dear Edmund,' said the priest, also excessively affected, for he really loved Edmund, "'it breaks my heart to see you thus, cruel Elvira.' oh blame her not father exclaimed edmund i cannot bear that even you should blame her she is deceived she is under the influence of infatuation we cannot control our hearts you know father but that she should be capable of loving another when your services your devoted affection alas alas father love is not to be bought by services all she could give she has given I possess her friendship and esteem. And are you satisfied with those? Satisfied, oh heavens! At any rate, I suppose you could bear to see her married to Prince Ferdinand, if you thought it would contribute to her happiness. Married to him? cried Edmund, gnashing his teeth in agony. Married to him? Oh, anything but that. I will never leave to see that. "'You are not likely,' calmly returned the priest, "'for as the state requires a victim, "'and as Elvira will certainly not resign her endymion, "'you will doubtless be sacrificed to save him.' "'Hold! hold!' cried Edmund, driven to madness by the thought. "'Do not dare to repeat those cursed words. "'I could die to serve her, but I will not be sacrificed. "'What? Am I to be made a tool?' a child, an idiot, destined to labour for my rival, and denied even the poor satisfaction of showing the extent of my devotion. But I will not die so calmly. Elvira shall not forget me. I will see her. She shall at least know my sentiments. And if she treats me with scorn, I will die, it is true. But it shall be by my own hand, and at her feet. I will not be sacrificed." I will not steal out of life like a common criminal. No, the world shall know my wrongs. I will be heard. I will not fall unnoticed and unknown. Take this chain, Father Morris, give it to her, and tell her I implore her, by the recollection of the moment when she bestowed it upon me, to grant me an interview. If she refuse me, but no, no, she cannot. Father Morris took the chain, and, promising to see the Queen, withdrew, leaving Lord Edmund in a state of indescribable agitation. He was not left long, however, to his solitary reflections, for, as he paced with hasty strides his prison, and turned as he reached the wall, the mummy, Chaops, stood before him. "'Ah, wretch!' cried Edmund. "'What brings you here? Come you to torment your victim?' "'I come to help and comfort the unfortunate,' said the mummy. "'Be gone!' cried Lord Edmund. "'I do not want your pity, and your proffered help I scorn.' 
Spare your scorn, proud lord, returned Chaos. It will not aid you, though I might. I want no aid, exclaimed Lord Edmund, and least of all such help as you can give me. I despise, I like your pity and your vengeance. Come what will, I rely upon myself. Conscious of my own integrity, I do not fear to fall, though demons should assail me. Avant then, fiend, for over me thou hast no power. Caobs burst into one of his fiendish laughs, and exclaiming, That time will show, disappeared. Edmund felt relieved by his absence, though in spite of his boasted firmness and the sovereign contempt he expressed for the mummy, he could not prevent his mind from dwelling upon the circumstance. The appearance of Caobs, indeed, never failed to excite a deep and powerful interest in the minds of all who conversed with him, whilst his appalling laugh struck terror to the firmest breast, and even those who affected to despise his menaces could not prevent their minds from dwelling upon his words. This irresistible power had its full effect upon the mind of Edmund, and, though he endeavoured in vain to shake it off and rouse his mind to think of other things, still the gigantic mummy seemed to stalk before him. In vain did he strive to picture to himself his interview with the queen. The hideous features of the mummy rose in his imagination instead of the lovely form of Elvira, till at length, fatigued and exhausted, he threw himself upon his couch and endeavoured to lose the remembrance of his cares in sleep. Yet, even in his dreams, the same image haunted him, and the same words rang in his ears. Whilst these scenes were taking place in the prison, Elvira was suffering all the torments of a burning fever. She was indeed seriously ill. The excessive agitation of her mind, and the horror she felt at the idea of being the murderer of Ferdinand, had overpowered her reason. And by the time Dr. Coleman arrived, he having been sent for on the first alarm, she was quite delirious. The thought that she alone had caused the danger of Ferdinand occupied her mind, and, not being able to bear the idea that her folly might occasion the destruction of a human being, she raved of him incessantly and repeatedly offered to sacrifice her life to preserve his. Her ravings were heard by her domestics, and being neither exactly understood nor correctly repeated, the reports, aided by the artful insinuations of Father Morris, soon produced rumours throughout the city that the queen was violently in love with Prince Ferdinand and had gone mad because the law did not permit her to marry him. The effect this idea produced was prodigious. It was implicitly believed, for the lower classes are naturally fond of the marvellous, and, when there are two sides to the question, are very seldom disposed to err by judging too favourably, whilst the indignation it excited was unbounded. In some cases, men are more tenacious of their prejudices than of their rights. Thus, then, though the English, by consenting to the marriage of their queen, had deprived themselves of the important right of electing their own sovereign, they considered what they had done as trifling when compared with the horror they felt at the thought of submitting to a foreign king. Whilst the emissaries of Rosabella, taking advantage of this feeling, by alternately playing upon their fears and magnifying their terrors, worked them up almost to a state of desperation. The party of Elvira, in the meantime, was quite unable to stem the torrent opposed to it. The queen and her father were both too ill to leave their beds, and Lord Edmund was in prison. "'What will become of us?' whispered Emma to Dr. Coleman one day in the chamber of Elvira, when she fancied the queen to be asleep. "'Tomorrow Prince Ferdinand and Lord Edmund are to be tried, and they say not even the queen has powers to pardon them if they are convicted.' "'It is but too true,' returned Dr. Coleman. "'They must die, and the punishment is horrid. "'The criminal is doomed to be burned by a slow fire.' "'Horrible!' cried Emma. "'And this only for drawing a sword in the vicinity of a royal palace.' "'Alas, that is not all. "'Ferdinand is accused of wishing to marry the queen, "'and the laws that devote to a horrid death "'the man who shall presume to address her in the language of love, "'yet hold good against foreigners.' I cannot believe Prince Ferdinand ever dared even to think of the Queen, said Emma. God only can judge the heart, observed Dr. Coleman. 
but I am sorry to say the proofs are very strong against him. I have heard from undoubted authority that persons will swear they heard him absolutely make love to the Queen, and that she promised to marry him if she could obtain the consent of her people. It is false, cried Elvira, starting from her bed, and standing suddenly between them. False as hell! Prince Ferdinand never addressed a single syllable breathing of love to me in his existence. He is the victim of a mistake, or rather of my folly. But he shall not die. I will save him, or perish in the attempt. The calm, decided tone in which Elvira spoke, and her spectral appearance produced an almost magical effect upon her auditors, and they stood awestruck and aghast while Elvira continued. Dress me, Emma. I will see my people. I will appeal to them myself. It is the day for receiving petitions in Blackheath Square. There will be a multitude assembled. I will go there in person and address them. It is the raving of delirium, whispered Emma to Dr. Coleman. What shall I do? Do you dare to hesitate? said Elvira, whose sense of hearing, sharpened by her recent illness, enabled her to catch distinctly the words of her favourite. Humour her, returned Dr. Coleman. In her present state, opposition would be fatal. It would indeed be fatal, said Elvira, seating herself in a large armchair, whilst the temporary colour her previous exertion had given her faded from her cheeks, and she looked the image of death. She will faint, cried Emma, flying for aid. It is impossible for her to go in this state said the doctor. Impossible, cried Elvira, starting up wildly, and her cheeks again glowing with the deepest crimson, whilst her eyes sparkled with superhuman fire. What is impossible to a determined spirit? Haste, haste, Emma, and let me go whilst I have yet strength. For go I will, though death await me there. My rashness has endangered the life of Prince Ferdinand, and I will die to save him. Farther opposition was useless, and the doctor retiring, Emma hastily attired her mistress. The people were expected to assemble as usual in the square, though from the illness of the queen a deputation of nobles had been appointed to receive the petitions. The feelings of Elvira were wrought up to an unnatural energy. Every limb trembled with agitation, and every nerve thrilled with impatience while she was dressing and when she was ready she descended the staircase, leaning upon the arm of Emma, her cheeks flushed with a hectic glow, her lips quivering, and her eyes shining with unusual brightness. At the foot of the staircase they met Keops. He steadfastly regarded the queen, and smiled at her agitated appearance, with his usual calm scorn. "'Oh, fearful spectre!' cried Elvira the moment she beheld him. I appeal to thee for help. My pride is humbled. I own to thee I love Seymour. Aid me to save Ferdinand, and I am thy slave. Appeal to your people, said Kebs, his fierce eyes flushing with proud triumph. Your feelings will give you eloquence. But do not confine yourself to obtaining the power to pardon Ferdinand. Demand to be free. The people will refuse you nothing. Tell them that they have insulted you by giving you permission to marry, and then dictating whom you shall choose. Require perfect freedom. They will comply and bow their necks beneath your footstool. But rest not satisfied with anything short of actual submission. Endure no conditions. This is the moment to decide your future destiny. Act with energy, and you will be happy. But if you falter, destruction is your portion. I will obey you to the letter, said Elvira, as she walked with a firm step past him, and sprang into her balloon, followed by Emma. Oh, my dear, dear mistress, said the faithful confidant, do not listen to that wretch. He is a serpent sent to wile you to destruction. I am certain he is a fiend incarnate. Do be advised. Do return and relinquish this mad enterprise. Elvira did not reply. Her feelings were far too highly wrought to permit her to speak, and bending eagerly forward, 
she watched with an impatient eye the streets and houses they flitted over scarcely able to bear the agony of suspense during the time necessary lost in the transit and seeming every instant to long to precipitate herself forward to the goal of her wishes the balloon now rose unusually high whilst masses of fleecy clouds hid the town from their view and looked like flocks of sheep beneath her feet we are going wrong cried elvira in agony we shall be too late no no said emma i feel we descend again we are arrived and as she spoke the balloon sank rapidly whilst the clouds opening discovered the immense square below them apparently paved with human heads thank god we are not too late cried elvira clasping her hands together and sinking back upon her seat whilst the balloon conductor directed the machine to the palace usually appointed for the reception of the queen elvira did not wait to arrange her dress she did not wait to take refreshment or even to rest a single moment from her fatigue but she rushed upon the terrace the instant she quitted the balloon and presented herself before her astonished people every limb quivering from the violence of her agitation the crowd was immense the extensive space looked one compact mass of human heads but elvira's courage did not fail her though she had now no lord edmund to support her and no father or applauding friends to listen as she spoke yet the enthusiasm of the moment gave her strength she forgot everything but the cause that brought her there and her mind thrown back upon its own resources rallied its energies and seemed to gather courage from the thought whilst her sylphic figure appeared to dilate in size and assume an almost awful dignity from the grandeur of the spirit that animated it as she thus stood before her subjects her life or death hanging upon their will her arrival had been hailed by the loudest shouts of wonder and of joy but when the multitude saw she wished to address them the tumult was hushed and they waited in breathless silence for her speech the deep stillness which prevailed amongst this so lately bustling crowd of human beings and the thought that every ear and every eye turned towards her slightly affected the nerves of elvira and her lips trembled when she began to speak but as she became warmed with her subject her voice gradually assumed its natural depth melody and sweetness whilst its full tones sank deep into the hearts of her auditors and carried conviction with them as she went on she first appealed to the gratitude of her people and after alluding to all she had done to secure peace and plenty to their domestic firesides she reverted to the misery of her own situation before the laws had been revoked which condemned her to celibacy she powerfully painted the harshness of the destiny that debarred her from the blessings she had so lavishly bestowed upon others she alone of all her subjects had been destined to the wretchedness of a solitary life unsoothed by the tender cares of a husband uncheered by the affection of children she alone had been doomed to wither away her youth in cheerless widowhood their fear had changed her destiny but was it the part of a noble and generous people whilst they conferred a benefit to encumber it with restrictions no she was confident the liberal spirit of the english would spurn the sordid thought and shrink from such a manner of obliging make me free said she really absolutely free and i promise solemnly you shall never have occasion to blush for your queen as she spoke her cheeks glowed and her eyes sparkled with unwonted fire whilst the people struck by the suddenness of her appearance and her enthusiasm and carried away by the force of the sentiment that could metamorphose the tender gentle elvira into the exalted being before them shouted applause whilst cries rang loudly through the air of long live elvira marry whom you list we will be your slaves still be our queen and let your children and children's children reign over us when you shall be no more delight danced in the bright eyes of elvira and a blush of pleasure mantled on her cheek as she gracefully thanked them and yet my friends continued she in a fainter voice there is another privilege i would demand at your hands i am called free and absolute 
yet I am chained by the laws. Unloose these bands, give me at least the power to pardon. I know that if I wished it, I might reverse these laws at my will, as the power of the queen who made them was not greater than that which you have bestowed upon me. But I wish not to do so. I would rather accept that from your hands as a favour which I might exact as a right. Give me then, my people, the most blessed attribute of royalty. Let me pardon. Can you refuse me this? No, no, shouted the people with enthusiasm. We are your slaves. Do with us as you list. The laws are yours. And though you change them at your pleasure, we will obey. Long live Elvira, Elvira forever. From henceforth we owe no law but her will. Elvira's rapture was unbounded. She forgot the unstable nature of the Vox Populi, and triumphed in the devotion of her people, whilst they, in return, as she warmly expressed her gratitude, shouted forth her praise in tumultuous transports. The air rang with acclamations, and Elvira, looking proudly round upon her obsequious subjects, felt herself indeed a queen. There is perhaps no sensation in the world more delightful than thus to feel oneself the idol of the multitude, to see every eye beaming with admiration, to hear every voice resounding praise, and to know every heart is devoted to one object. The human mind cannot enjoy a higher gratification than in the consciousness of power, whilst the man thus exalted seems raised to the level of divinity and triumphs in the worship of his fellow creatures. But, alas, such glory is too much for mortals, and nothing can be more evanescent, or rather nothing a more certain prelude to disgrace. Elvira, however, knew not that her popularity was too great to be lasting. She implicitly believed her people would continue to feel what they now expressed, and, catching the spirit of the moment, she persuaded them to sign an abolition of the laws and a confirmation of her absolute power. The people obeyed with rapture. The enthusiasm which animated them had not yet abated, and, even if Elvira had desired their lives, they would have obeyed. They considered her inspired, and it seemed sacrilege even to hesitate to comply with their commands. So powerful was the energy of a woman's will, and so sure it is that a determined spirit may overcome any difficulties when once roused resolutely to exert itself. Such also is the influence of beauty and eloquence upon the human mind, and so weak is judgment when attacked through the medium of the senses. In the meantime, the council of Elvira had met in their usual apartment, and were holding a solemn consultation, previous to going to receive the petitions on the propriety of addressing the people whom they might find assembled in the square, respecting the illness and consequent incapacity for reigning of the queen. Thinking as I think, and as I am confident every one here must think, said Lord Gustavus de Montfort, there is no middle course to be pursued. A regency must be appointed, or the government will be overturned. Oh, there is no doubt we cannot exist without a regency, said Lord Noodle. Yes, yes, we must have a regency, cried Lord Doodle. It appears to me, to say the least of it, premature, observed the Duke of Exeter who, from his regard for Edmund, had hitherto observed a cautious neutrality. I think before deciding upon so important a question, we should at least examine Her Majesty's physicians and be guided by their report. His Grace is quite right, said Lord Noodle. We ought to examine the physicians, said Lord Doodle. One of them has just entered the council chamber, observed Lord Gustavus. I presume he brings the usual daily bulletin of Her Majesty's health. Is it your pleasure, my lords, that he be examined? By all means, cried all the noble lords simultaneously, and Dr. Hardman advanced. How is Her Most Gracious Majesty? asked Lord Gustavus with his usual solemnity. Alas, my lord, said Dr. Hardman, Her Majesty has slept badly and is much worse this morning. Is she still delirious? asked the Duke of Exeter. Quiet, your grace, returned the doctor, shaking his head. Then I fear there is no hope, said the Duke. None, 
said Lord Noodle, shaking his head. None, echoed Lord Doodle, shaking his. Thinking as I think, and as I am sure everyone here must think, or at least ought to think, said Lord Gustavus, we must not suffer the interests of the people to be invaded with impunity. The Constitution requires watching over, and I consider this a matter which ought to be inquired into. Then you think the senses of the Queen irrecoverable? asked the Duke of Exeter, addressing Dr. Hardman. Not irrecoverable, I hope, my Lord Duke, replied the doctor, though I own her delirium is alarming. What does she rave about? asked Lord Doodle, curiosity being the only mark he ever gave of his being a rational animal. It is a delicate subject, returned the doctor, and if your lordships will excuse me. Oh, no, you must tell us, said Lord Doodle. Thinking as I think, and as I am sure everyone who hears me must think, or at least ought to think, said Lord Gustavus, concealment in this case would be a crime. Since your lordships command me, replied the doctor, however reluctant I may be to betray Her Majesty's secrets, it is my duty to obey. The Queen raves incessantly of Prince Ferdinand. I feared as much, said the Duke of Exeter. And do you think if she recovers she'll want to marry him? asked Lord Doodle. I fear it cannot be doubted, my lord, returned the doctor. Then, thinking as I think, and as every free-born Englishman ought to think, said Lord Gustavus, she will forfeit her crown. A deep silence followed this daring speech, yet, though no one assented to it, no one attempted to contradict it. In fact, every man seemed afraid of committing himself, for, though every one thought Lord Gustavus would not have ventured so far had he not felt assured the party against the Queen was strong, yet no one liked to be the first to declare himself her opponent. This awkward pause was broken by the entrance of Sir Ambrose and Father Morris, who came with a message from the Duke of Cornwall, imploring them not to decide upon any measures hastily, and informing them that on the following day his physicians assured him he would be able to assist their deliberations in person. "'We all esteem and respect the Duke,' said Lord Gustavus, "'but thinking as I think, and as I am confident everyone who hears me must think, or at least ought to think, not even our respect for him ought to induce us to consent that the Queen should marry a foreigner. No, no, we must not let private feelings make us risk the interests of the people. I dare say they will not be in any danger, murmured the soft insinuating voice of Father Morris. I dare say they will run no risk. Foreigners have sometimes been known to respect the interests of a people, and reign as gloriously as native-born monarchs. Not often, I believe, father, said Sir Ambrose. At any rate, I am sure it would break the Duke's heart to see his daughter married to Prince Ferdinand, and I am sure it would break mine to see him King of England. Weak, silly Elvira, I cannot account for her infatuation, and I have no patience with her for causing all this misery solely by her folly. You use strong language, Sir Ambrose, said the Duke of Exeter. No stronger than the occasion requires, my Lord Duke, returned the worthy baronet. I have known the Queen from her childhood, and loved her as a daughter, but now... The matter must certainly be inquired into, said Lord Gustavus. It is the duty of every well-disposed patriotic Englishman not to suffer the slightest invasion of the Constitution. Our laws are our bulwarks. We owe to die in defense of our laws, and if the Queen be no longer in a fit state to administer them, or if she contemplate the design of putting the administration of them into hands in which their purity will be contaminated, then, thinking as I think, and as I feel confident every individual who hears me must think, or at least ought to think, there can remain only one course for us to pursue. Perhaps, said Father Morris, we may be deceived, and the delirium of the Queen may be transient, or at least her mentioning the name of Prince Ferdinand in her ravings, quite accidental. It is not well to be too rash. Oh, no, Reverend Father, replied Lord Gustavus, you deceive yourself. 
your obstruction from the world and the goodness of your heart lead you to judge too favorably of others but we who know the world see deeper you holy father can form no idea of the folly of human passions you are above their weaknesses and cannot suspect that in another which you are incapable of feeling yourself but as i said before we that know the world see deeper elvira is in love with prince ferdinand and is quite capable of sacrificing her throne and people to the caprices of her romantic passion impossible cried father maurice with well-acted astonishment it is very true notwithstanding said lord gustavus shaking his head sagaciously whilst his attended satellites the lords noodle and doodle shook theirs for sympathy impossible cried sir ambrose she cannot surely carry her infatuation to such a height she is too noble but even if she be so mad will no one step forward and save her from destruction i do not see how any one can save her if such be her intentions said the duke of exeter women are proverbially self-willed and now that the people have put the laws into her own hands the people were cajoled into consent exclaimed lord gustavus but if the queen be so mad as to intend to marry the prince she must lose her throne and suffer death for the laws against foreigners remain inexorable yes the laws are inexorable echoed the lords noodle and doodle good heaven cried sir ambrose is it possible i am in england and yet hear such barbarous sentiments openly avowed no one has more right to feel anger at the folly of elvira than myself but even i cannot bear such cruelty what is a young and beautiful woman in the very flower of her age to be doomed to destruction merely for having shown a susceptible heart forbid it heaven and what are we that we should dare to judge so harshly and refuse mercy to a fellow-creature are we not all feeble do we not all err and if we show such cruelty in judging a trifling offence how shall we expect mercy for our own more weighty ones have mercy then let us show ourselves men let us dare to exert our reason and throw off the shackles of prejudice we boast that the law in this case makes us free and arms us with power against our sovereign let us use that power then and show that we are really free by daring to act justly if we do not we are slaves it cannot be said lord gustavus you talk well sir ambrose but words are nothing against facts if the queen intend to marry prince ferdinand she must either be insane or intend to subvert the constitution and in either case thinking as i think and as i am sure every reasonable person in the kingdom must think or at least ought to think she is no longer competent to reign and is no longer worthy to live eloquence is a fine thing and i do not deny that the worthy baronet speaks fluently yet notwithstanding all he can say or indeed all that can be said upon the subject law is law yes law is law echoed the repeating lords sir ambrose i thank you from my soul cried the old duke of cornwall starting from the midst of the crowd you have indeed proved yourself my friend but i should blush to think that my daughter was slandered in my presence and that i left it to another to undertake her defence yes gentlemen elvira is slandered i will venture my life upon her innocence her heart is english my lords thoroughly english she will marry no german no no my poor dear elvira never dreamed of such a thing she is innocent and here the poor old man overpowered by his emotions could not proceed but leaning upon the shoulder of his friend sir ambrose wept bitterly it is hard to see the tears of aged men and every one was affected they had started at the sudden appearance of the duke amongst them for his gaunt looks and wasted form aided by the belief of his serious illness gave him more the aspect of a spectre than a man and now his trembling voice and grey hairs as he attempted to vindicate his child came home to the hearts of his auditors alas 
Why is not Edmund here? sighed Sir Ambrose. He would not have left the cause of Elvira to such feeble hands. But he is gone, and, wretched father that I am, I may soon no longer possess my darling boy. Six months ago, two brave sons were the pride of my heart and the admiration of every eye. Where are they now? The one wandering in foreign climes, exposed to every misery of want, and the other confined in a prison and doomed to suffer an ignominious death. Alas, alas, why has my life been spared to endure such misery? End of chapter 4, part 1 of volume 3Volume 3, Chapter 4, Part 2 of The Mummy, A Tale of the Twenty-Second Century. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Mummy, A Tale of the Twenty-Second Century by Jane Loudon, Volume 3, Chapter 4, Part 2. Whilst the old man thus lamented, a bustle was heard among the crowd, and the noble lords of whom it was composed, dividing, made way for Elvira. With glowing cheeks and sparkling eyes, the queen walked proudly along the lane made for her, having a roll of parchment in her hand, and with dignity took her seat upon the vacant throne. A solemn silence prevailed. The conspirators were awed by the sudden appearance of their sovereign, and those who had hitherto remained neutral, surprised, stood hesitating and knowing how to act. Elvira paused a few seconds, sternly surveying the crowd, and finding that no one attempted to speak, she exclaimed, "'How now, my lords? What means this silence? I came to assist your counsels, not to interrupt them. Go on, I pray you, for surely such enlightened senators can have no sentiments they fear to breathe before the Queen. We were surprised at the sudden appearance of your Majesty.' said the Duke of Exeter. As from the report of your Majesty's physicians, we had feared your Majesty's illness. My illness was of the mind, my Lord Duke, said Elvira, and this is the medicine that has cured it. Look, my lords, continued she, unrolling the parchment she carried, and suddenly flashing it before their eyes, behold my panacea, now I am indeed a queen, for my people have made me absolute, and, abolishing all laws, have placed their lives and fortunes at my feet. Lord Gustavus and his adherents stood aghast, gazing upon the queen and the parchment she held so triumphantly, without the power of uttering a word. Ere this, continued the queen, the purport of this parchment has received some thousand signatures. Yet I do not wish to abuse my power. Go, my lords, I have no longer occasion for your counsels, when I have, I will summon you. The dignified manner in which Elvira waved her hand as she said this prevented reply, and the lords of the council dispersed, without daring to utter a single syllable. The duke and Sir Ambrose alone remained. My dear father, cried Elvira, throwing her arms round his neck, whilst the overstrained feelings that had so long supported her gave way, and she sobbed in agony upon his shoulder. Remove her to her chamber said Dr. Coleman, who now appeared. This agitation will destroy her. Her exhausted frame is not able to endure it. In fact, the queen was now completely overpowered, and was carried off by Emma and her attendants in violent hysterics. Lord Maysworth had not been present at this scene, for his time had been otherwise engaged, and to explain what occupied him it will be necessary to go back to the prison of Prince Ferdinand. It may be recollected, when Chaos removed Clara, he had informed the prince that Lord Maysworth and Father Murphy would be with him in a few hours. The mummy's information was correct, for at the appointed time they came. Oh, said Father Murphy, and where's Clara? So they've let me in after all, you see, for, knowing Lord Maysworth was your friend, I went to consult him, and when he talked to them and told them how barbarous it was to deny a poor fellow that was just going to be burnt alive the consolations of religion, they hadn't the heart to refuse me. Oh, groaned Prince Ferdinand, is there no hope of escape? 
"'I fear not,' said Lord Maysworth, "'for notwithstanding the enormous expense attending public executions, "'the people are so fond of them that it is necessary to indulge them now and then, "'and they are so devoted to Lord Edmund that his adversary has no chance. "'Besides, they say there are plenty of witnesses to prove that you have addressed the most impassioned language to the Queen. Your enthusiasm one night at her singing. I remember, cried Prince Ferdinand. Idiot that I was. Oh, curses on my folly. Oh, that's right, exclaimed Father Murphy. Indulge yourself a little, my honey, and it will do you good. I don't know a prettier amusement than cursing and swearing and finding fault when one's in trouble and I'd be far from denying ye a little harmless indulgence, for as you are to die so soon, it would be cruel, you know, not to let you have all the consolation ye can get hold of. Oh, exclaimed Prince Ferdinand, I am the most wretched of human beings. And you may say that, for I don't see any great hope you have in respect that the people must have a victim, and they'd like to have you better than Lord Edmund. But never mind that, for the worst that can happen at all is that you'll be roasted alive. Oh, groaned Prince Ferdinand, not much consoled by this encouraging speech. Behemir, exclaimed Hans, and can nothing be done? For though roasting alive may be the worst that can happen, I don't think my master such an amateur in cookery as to wish to try the experiment. Oh, cried Father Murphy, and I am quite of your opinion, and so— if the prince would just try and get ready a word or two of defence, or if some clever person that knows the world, like your lordship, for instance, would just give him a word or two of advice, the thing would be done entirely and all right. Oh, cried the prince, clasping his hands together, save me, I implore you to save me. I will do all I can, said Lord Maysworth, smiling most graciously. Rely upon me, prince. The suggestion of the Holy Father shall be attended to. The gratitude I owe your father demands my greatest exertions, and I am most happy to have an opportunity of serving his son. This worthy father's plan is excellent. I wonder it did not strike me before. Confide securely in me, prince. A proper defence shall be prepared, and I think by it you may escape. So saying, he retired, leaving Prince Ferdinand somewhat consoled by his assurances, but by no means reconciled even to the possibility of being roasted alive. The intermediate time between this conversation and the day fixed for the trial of the prince was spent by Lord Maysworth in preparing, with the assistance of those learned in the law, this defence, and, when it was finished, his rapture was beyond description. Three times did he read it over with still increasing satisfaction, for, as he considered it as his own production, he regarded it with all the true yet indescribable rapture of a doting parent. We are all so fond of our own children, whether of the mind or of the body, regarding them as emanations from ourselves, upon which we may indulge our self-love without the grossness of undisguised vanity that the transport of Lord Maysworth is not surprising though he actually carried it so far that, notwithstanding his professed attachment and gratitude to the German emperor, I believe, if the means of procuring the prince's escape had been offered to him, he would rather have let him stay at the risk of being burned alive than have lost the pleasure he anticipated on hearing the delivery of his speech. The important day arrived, and the prince, accompanied by his faithful Hans and Lord Maysworth, proceeded on the court the latter carrying his beloved brief in his own pocket, rightly considering it far too estimable to be entrusted into any other hands than his. The court was crowded to an excess, for strange tales of the passion and illness of the queen had gone forth into the world, each edition more wonderful than that which went before it, and the people now thronged to see the prince with that extraordinary feeling, so common amongst the English, which makes them stare at a great man in much the same way as they would at a wild beast. An automaton judge sat with great dignity upon a magnificent throne, looking, though a little heavy, quite as wise and sagacious as judges are wont to look. A real jury, that is, a jury of flesh and blood, was ranged upon one side of him, and some automaton counsel sat in front. Their briefs lying upon the table before them, and having behind each a clerk ready to wind him up when he should be wanted to speak. 
it being found that the profession of the law gives such an amazing volubility of words that it was dangerous to wind up the council too soon lest they should go off in the wrong place and so disturb the silence of the court in different parts of this council were holes into which briefs being put they were gradually ground to pieces as the council were being wound up till they came forth in words at the mouth whilst the language in which the council pleaded depended entirely upon the hole into which the brief was put there being a different one for every possible tongue all now was ready the prisoner with his friends placed themselves at the bar and the judge and jury prepared to hear and decide with all due decorum the signal to begin was given and the brief for the crown being put into the english department of the council appointed to conduct the prosecution the clerk began to wind away and in a few minutes the council burst forth in the following impassioned strain of eloquence my lord and gentlemen of the jury it is with feelings of the most unfaint regret that i now rise to address you sensible oh how deeply sensible am i of my insufficiency and of the much greater competency of any one of my learned brethren at the bar and how willingly would i resign the task to any one of those eloquent gentlemen feeling so indisputably convinced as i do of their eminent talents and their merit and of their great oh how much greater fitness for an undertaking of this magnitude than myself ha ah, es ist aus mit uns wir sind verloren cried hans if thou art so unfit for the task i wonder why the deuce they employed thee peace fool said the prince do you not see that this is only the exordium these are words of course the orator had paused for an instant from some error of his machinery but his clerk setting him in motion again he went on as follows but having been deputed to act i will not shrink from the arduous duty imposed upon me i will therefore state the principal points of the case prove my facts by witnesses and then leave the decision to the well-known judgment and penetration of the enlightened and intelligent tribunal before me it was here intended the counsel should bow to the court but owing to his defective machinery he only gave a kind of jerk and then continued my lord and gentlemen it sometimes falls to the lot of members of my profession to relate astounding circumstances and soul-harrowing facts facts which pierce into the inmost souls of their auditors and rend their tortured spirits by their iron fangs as the teeth of the tangible harrows pierce into and rend asunder the clods of inanimate earth over which they are dragged but what i shall have to tell you gentlemen will make even facts like these hide their diminished heads and run skulking into corners like owls trembling and flying hooting away on being exposed to the scorching glare of the noonday sun do you not tremble gentlemen do not your hearts pant in breathless expectation of what is coming indulge your anticipations be it fancy take her wildest flight and let imagination conjure up all the horrors of the infernal regions paint the angel of death hovering upon leathern wings over a devoted city and shrieking mothers imploring mercy in vain for their murdered children paint all the multiplied horrors of famine fire and carnage paint miserable starving wretches screaming wildly for food and in the agonies of despair gnawing the flesh from their own withering bones paint flames surrounding with their pointed arms a helpless family crying in bitter anguish for the aid which cannot be afforded them paint witches celebrating their detested sabbath imagine demons indulging in their infernal revels yes paint and picture to yourself all this and ten thousand other horrors each more frightful than the last dwell upon them let them haunt your imagination but whatever you may fancy picture or paint nothing can ever equal the horror you will feel when you learn the crime of which the prisoner at the bar stands accused know then my tongue falters as i speak and my quivering lips almost refuse to give utterance to the appalling sounds know that he has dared impiously and presumptuously dared to fall in love with a queen 
I see your indignation at such baseness. I feel the virtuous shame that burns upon every cheek. Yes, yes, my friends, I too am an Englishman, and I, like you, spurn with disdain the thought of submitting to a stranger. What do we want with the king? Has not the country been happy, prosperous, and flourishing, respected at home and honoured abroad, all under the mild dominion of a queen? Yes, yes, my friends, it has, and under her gentle sway the murderous weapon of war has been converted into a ploughshare, the nodding helmet and ponderous corslet into the peaceful wig and graceful gown, and the grim aspect of frowning ruin and grinning desolation into the bewitching smiles of benignant peace and overwhelming plenty. Long, long may peace continue to shed her benignant smiles upon us. Long, long may we sit beneath the grateful shade of her olive branches, and long, long may the feathery foliage hang in graceful festoons above our heads, and their pale green wreaths encircle our brows. For in the arms of peace lie joy, ease and happiness her smile gives health and contentment and her blessing wealth and what threatens to affright this enchanting deity from our shores tis this audacious stranger who deserves the bitterest punishment for his unparalleled atrocity but this is not all not as satisfied with endeavouring to destroy the happiness of the kingdom and overturn the laws enacted by the wisdom of our ancestors he has done more yes intolerable as his crimes have been there is still one more deadly behind shudder my friends and turn away your eyes as the fear-inspiring words drop from my tongue he has dared to draw arms within the precincts of the original palace insufferable audacity hear this you shades of former royalty and tremble in your elysian groves at the profane hand which has dared thus boldly to invade your august privileges can it be believed will after ages credit the report oh no no the fact will appear too monstrous for even credulity itself to swallow when the crime the fatal crime was committed earth trembled beneath his feet the winds hushed their murmurs and all nature stood aghast the frightened ocean receded from its rocky bed. Pluto rushed shivering from his nether throne, and Neptune waved in vain his tranquilizing trident. The elements were convulsed. Lightning streamed from the swords of the combatants, and thunder rolled above their heads as they stood, like two heroes of Arabian fiction, yielding the elements in their wrath. But I have done, my lord and gentlemen. I say no more for I scorn to prejudice your minds against the prisoner, or make the slightest appeal to your feelings to condemn him. However, this I must say, that if ever a case could rouse every nerve of a true-born Englishman against it, it is this. Does any man dread to be torn from the calm delights of his comfortable fireside, where he was surrounded by his adoring wife and attentive children, and doomed to incur all the wretchedness of misery and want? let him condemn the prisoner does any man dread being dragged across burning sands or forced to wade up to the knees in water through marshy deserts let him condemn the prisoner would any man shudder to be obliged to sleep upon the hard cold ground his limbs racked with rheumatism and his body exposed to all the vicissitudes of hunger thirst and inclement seasons whilst his life is endangered every instant let him condemn the prisoner but if he prefer these horrors to the comforts of a warm down bed or if he enjoy the prospect of having his substance devoured by tax-gatherers to support the expenses of a foreign war then let the prisoner be acquitted but unless he can make up his mind to undergo privations like these let him aid by his vote to condemn the wretch who and here the orator stopped abruptly being quite gone down he had indeed uttered the last words gradually slower and slower and at lengthened intervals 
because the attendant clerk had unfortunately given him a turn too little and had not screwed him up quite tight enough the witnesses were now called several spoke to the circumstance of the extravagant admiration expressed by the prince of elvira's singing others deposed to the fact of the combat and others mentioned the queen's sighing and obstruction but the principal one distinctly stated that he had heard the prince make the queen an offer of his hand in the gardens of the somerset house and that she had consented to marry him if she could obtain the consent of her people a general thrill of indignation ran through the court at this evidence and it was with difficulty that silence was obtained for the pleading of the defendant at last all was still and the attendant clerk began to wind up the counsel for the prince lord maysworth watched the moment but being afraid to trust his beloved brief into any hands but his own unfortunately in his agitation he popped into the wrong hall and when the counsel began to speak he burst forth in french words are wanting to express lord maysworth's unutterable consternation at this unfortunate accident stop stop cried he hush hush can nobody stop him but the inexorable counsel would not stop for once wound up and properly set in motion not all the powers of heaven and earth combined could stop him till he had fairly run down what shall i do cried lord maysworth in an agony of despair for if the judge and jury don't understand french my fine oration will be utterly lost oh if that be all said the clerk your lordship need not distress yourself for as soon as i found that was going on i ran up to the judge and pulled out his lordship's french stop and the gentlemen of the jury oh they all understand french it is well said lord maysworth though i am still sorry the whole happened to be french as i am afraid the verbosity of the language may deteriorate the strength of my expressions thus muttered the noble lord not sorry however i believe if the whole truth were to be openly declared that he had an excuse in the change of languages for the failure of his speech if it should not happen to meet with that brilliant success that he felt so perfectly confident it deserved the counsel in the meantime went on the following is a translation of his speech my lord and gentlemen of the jury it is with feelings of considerable diffidence and hesitation that i rise to address you after the flood of eloquence which has poured from my learned brother i gentlemen am not gifted with such an enviable facility of speech nor is my imagination endowed with that creative power he has so forcibly displayed i cannot gentlemen like him uprear the club of hercules for what to crush a butterfly or brain a nut nor have i the least intention of drawing either neptune or pluto from the quiet nap they have been taking for so many centuries to assist in our debate i assure you also gentlemen that i shall neither disturb the ocean from its rocky bed nor make nature stand aghast no my lord and gentlemen my intentions are perfectly pacific and your harassed imaginations may repose tranquilly upon my speech after the tumultuous one of my learned brother as the wayworn traveller rests peaceably upon the soft green turf after having been tossed about upon the heaving billows of the tempestuous ocean tis sweet to rest from dread of danger free and mark the billows of the foaming sea tis sweet a little skiff to safely urge through the tempestuous ocean's boiling surge to hear the pattering rains against the roof and feel your hospitable mansion proof but sweeter far the troubled mind's repose when of a speech like this it hears the close when i listened to the powerful exordium of my learned friend and i did listen to him with the most profound attention i confess my imagination was too highly excited to be satisfied with so lame and impotent a conclusion what cried i have the laws of nature been reversed have demons been disturbed in their infernal revels and witches called from their dusky caverns merely because a beautiful woman has excited a tender passion in the breast of a youthful stranger is this so extraordinary an occurrence that it should create such excessive wonder are our hearts so dead to beauty that such a catastrophe should occasion surprise for bid it heaven no whilst our hearts still throb in our bosoms may they ever beat responsive to the attractions of the fair 
may we never become insensible to the charms of the loveliest objects of creation may we ever own their witchery and bend beneath their magic sway or man degraded man would soon sink below the level of the brutes view man as he degenerates when secluded from the influence of female society is he not rough brutal and unpolished does he not want all those winning graces and those delicate attentions which form so undeniably the charm and solace of life in proportion as our sensibility as our goodness and all the best feelings of our nature are awakened we become susceptible of love it is indeed excessive sensibility and a kindly feeling to our fellow-creatures that creates it does there exist a generous or noble mind that has not felt this passion no not one there is indeed something generous and ennobling in it we cannot prefer the welfare of another to our own nor be completely absorbed in another's being with the devotedness of true love without becoming purified in our ideas and raised from that disgusting selfishness which is ever the inspirer of base and mean actions yes love indeed is light from heaven a spark of that immortal fire with angels shared by allah given to lift from earth our low desire devotion wafts the mind above but heaven itself descends in love and from this heavenly this inspiring feeling shall my unfortunate client be debarred hear me you shades of heroic lovers who though dying for the hopeless object of your passion have still exclaimed with the enthusiastic devotion of a modern poet lead on lead on though horrors wait in awful fury round thy gate and danger death and grim despair forbid my hopeless passage there in love still smiling beckon on the path is past the gate is won and ye poets and philosophers who have painted love as the oasis of the desert the green spot in memory's waste where affection still lingers even when hope decays have you no compassion for my unhappy client whose only fault was that she was beautiful and he not blind and is this an offence for which a man deserves to be burned alive forbid it humanity forbid it mercy no no such inhuman cruelty exists not in the breasts of englishmen i know i feel that you must acquit my client on this head but this is not the only charge brought against him he is accused of having violated the sanctity of a royal palace by drawing his sword within its precinct to describe the enormity of this crime my learned friend has brought forward such an overwhelming torrent of eloquence that unhappily his meaning was swept away in the current of his words at least i suppose so as with all my industry i have been totally unable to find it as however i cannot imagine my learned friend could have harangued so long without having some meaning in what he said i suppose it has slipped undiscovered into some sly corner where it lies poor thing quite concealed and almost crushed to death by the ponderous weight of metaphors heaped upon it gentlemen my client drew his sword in the royal garden this is the plain statement of the fact when stripped of the load of ornaments with which my learned friend has encumbered it my client a stranger to the english laws and customs chanced to be walking in the public garden belonging to a royal palace he there met a nobleman of the court from causes irrelevant to the question before us high words took place between them my client was grossly insulted in a manner impossible to be borne by a man calling himself a gentleman or making the least pretensions to honour he drew his sword to defend himself can anything be more simple and yet for this all created nature is thrown into confusion and neptune and pluto called shivering from their beds gentlemen my learned friend's brain was teeming with the monstrous conception and longing to be delivered he dragged it into the speech with which we have just been favoured not satisfied with piercing us through with the fangs of a mental harrow plunging us into all the disasters of war and distracting our imaginations by exhibiting the combined effects of plague pestilence and famine he has entangled in his snares these unfortunate deities 
whom he has forced to upper earth to bear witness on his behalf, I am afraid, very much against their wills. Nothing, indeed, can be more distressing than to see an unfortunate thought, thus hunted through the meandering of a sentence, a crowd of unmeaning words, like a pack of hungry dogs pressing close at its back, till at last, worn out and completely exhausted, it sinks feebly away, and gives up the ghost so quietly that no one can reasonably imagine what can possibly have become of it. Thus it was with the argument of my learned friend. It has vanished amidst the puzzle he created around it. One thing more, my lord and gentlemen, and I have done, for I shall not, like my learned friend, after disclaiming all intentions of appealing to your feelings, endeavour by an artful peroration to come home to your inmost souls. It is simply this, that my client is a stranger, the son of a powerful foreign monarch, and, of course, as he has never taken any oath of allegiance to the English government, he is not amenable to the English laws. After stating this fact, I sit down confidently assured that your verdict will be in my favour, and that by it, you will again vindicate the proud right you have so long and so gloriously maintained of acting always as enlightened and free-born Englishmen. As the orator sat down, a tumult of applause rang through the hall, and the delight of Lord Maysworth can be only justly appreciated by an author who recollects what he felt when he first heard of the success of a favourite work. But he had little time for exultation, as the judge, having been wound up in his turn, now began to sum up the evidence, slowly and heavily did he go on the machinery that composed him wanting oil and creaking ominously as it moved whilst ere he had half finished a cry was heard through the outer court and instantly a rush of people announced the arrival of the queen after the exertions made by elvira the previous day her fever returned and she lay insensible to everything that passed till she was restored to recollection by the tolling of a deep-toned bell which was always set in motion the moment a prisoner was put upon his defence. She heard the solemn sound distinctly. The court, where state criminals were tried, adjoined the palace, in order that the Queen might have an opportunity of hearing appeals or deciding on any difficult case that might arise. Though, as offences against the state had been very rare in the female dynasty, whether from the goodness of the people or the severity of the punishment, I leave it for my readers to determine, the privilege had been seldom called in action, and the bell now grated harshly as it tolled. Elvira, however, had heard of the custom, and its cause flashed instantly upon her mind, as she started from her bed and listened to the solemn sound as it fell slowly and heavily upon her ear, every knell seeming to strike upon the naked nerve. "'Emma!' cried she. "'Let me go, quick, let me save him, or I shall be too late!' Emma obeyed but whilst she was attiring her mistress every moment seemed an age and elvira listened to the heavy tolling bell till the sense of hearing became agony and unable to endure any more she pressed her hands firmly against her ears to shut out the dreaded sound at length she was ready and hurrying to the court arrived just at the critical moment i have mentioned stop cried she i command you to stop proceedings the prisoner is free my people have given me a right to pardon all offences, and I thus first exercise it. Set him free. The guards obeyed, and it not being possible to stop the automaton judge till he had run down, he was carried out of court, repeating, for it happened he was summing up the evidence at that moment, and the queen said she loved him, and would sacrifice even her life for his sake. You are free, sir, said Elvira to the prince. I only blush that a stranger should have been so inhospitably treated in my court. My illness, however, must plead my excuse, and I can only now show my sorrow by releasing you from the parole of honour you have given. You are absolutely free, prince, not only from these chains, but also to leave the kingdom whenever you shall think fit. The prince, in a transport of gratitude, knelt and kissed her hand, and then retired with his friends to the house of Lord Maysworth whilst elvira satisfied with herself and hoping she had disarmed scandal by desiring the prince to quit the kingdom returned to her palace more happy than she had felt since the fatal combat in the garden End of chapter four part two of volume three
Volume Three, Chapter Five, of the Mummy: A Tale of the Twenty Second Century. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Mummy: A Tale of the Twenty Second Century by Jane Loudon, Volume Three, Chapter Five. The effect produced by the scene just described upon the minds of the multitude was magical. It seemed a confirmation, strong as proofs of holy writ, of all that had been urged against the queen, and alienated from her side even those who had remained neutral. "'I really could not have believed it possible,' said the Duke of Exeter, as he retired slowly from the court. "'Thinking as I think, and as I am confident everyone else must think, or at least ought to think,' said Lord Gustavus, she seems to have lost all sense even of common decency what do you say to this sir ambrose asked dr hardman triumphantly nothing replied sir ambrose sighing then the case is hopeless said the duke of exeter for i know sir ambrose so well that i am certain if a single word could be said in the queen's behalf he would not remain silent your grace judges me too favourably returned Sir Ambrose. For the reason the contrary, much to be said for the Queen, if I had been disposed to say it. You see the story of her wishing to marry Ferdinand was evidently false, for she desired him in plain terms to quit the kingdom. A mere blind, cried Lord Gustavus, who felt he had now gone too far to recede. An absolute farce, and I am only astonished a man of your penetration, Sir Ambrose, could have been deceived by it. It has long been the proudest boast of the English law, said Sir Ambrose, that every one is presumed innocent until he be proved guilty, and I confess I do not see why the Queen should alone be made an exception to the rule. Lord Gustavus made no reply, and the party proceeded to their several homes. The following day was appointed for the trial of Lord Edmund, and the court was, if possible, yet more crowded than before. For the singular termination of Prince Ferdinand's trial had created the most intense anxiety upon the part of the mob to know what would be the result of that of Lord Edmund. It has been already stated that he was the idol of the people, and now thousands of human voices shouted his praises to the sky, and heaped curses and execrations upon his enemies. The tumult, however, was hushed to breathless expectation when it was announced that the officers of justice were gone in search of the prisoner, and innumerable human beings stood craning their necks over the lane made for his approach through the crowd, all eager to catch the first glimpse of him. But what language can express their disappointment and surprise when they saw the officers return, pale and trembling, fear painted upon their countenances, and their teeth chattering in their heads? "'He's gone!' they cried. "'The prison door was locked, and the windows fast, but he is gone, and doubtless some evil spirit has carried him off.' Great was the consternation excited by this unexpected news. Every one rushed to the prison, and each in turn was struck with horror on finding it exactly in the state the officers had described. "'It is the mummy that has done this,' said the people, whispering among themselves. "'Some horrible event certainly hangs over us. It is in vain to attempt to resist our destiny. All is supernatural, and we are merely blind instruments in the hands of fate.' The disappearance of Lord Edmund had, however, nothing supernatural in it, and indeed was effected by very simple means and mere mortal agents. The agitation of his mind after his interview with Caobs became excessive, and every hour seemed stretched to an unnatural length as he anxiously awaited Father Morris's return. But the monk came not. Lord Edmund's impatience increased every instant till it became absolute agony. Yet still he was alone. He paced his chamber with uncertain steps, his brain burning with incipient madness, till no longer knowing what he did, he dashed his head against the walls and tore off his hair by handfuls. In this state the jailer found him, and reporting his condition, 
His trial, which was to have taken place previously to that of Ferdinand, was postponed in a few days to allow time for his recovery. Bleeding and blistering reduced Lord Edmund's fever, but his soul was still on fire. In the paroxysms of his disorder, no less than in his lucid intervals, one sole idea seemed to have taken possession of his fancy, and he inquired incessantly if Father Morris were returned. No, no, was the continual answer to his queries, till the heart of the poor prisoner sickened within him at the sound. At length he appeared well enough to take his trial, and the day was fixed, as we have already stated. The mind of Edmund now seemed tolerably composed, but it was the stillness of apathy rather than that of resignation and on the night preceding the day fixed for his trial, some of his former anxious and tormenting fantasies returned. "'I will shake off this weakness,' said he. "'I will read.' And drawing his chair near the fire, he took up a book. It was in vain, however, for though he read over the same page repeatedly, he could not compose his mind sufficiently to comprehend its meaning. He threw his book aside, and fixing his eyes upon the fire, was soon lost in gloomy meditations. When a slight noise attracted his attention, and, looking round, he saw a panel in the wall slowly detach itself, and Father Morris appear in the aperture, followed by another figure, closely wrapped in a large black cloak. "'Father Morris!' cried Edmund. "'Is it indeed Father Morris, or some kind spirit that has assumed his shape?' "'It is indeed I, my son,' returned the priest, "'and I come to rescue and console you.' "'Methinks you come somewhat late, father,' said Edmund rather coldly, "'for I have suffered much since I saw you.' "'Others have suffered also,' resumed the monk, "'and for your sake, notwithstanding you have fancied yourself neglected and forgotten by all the world, there is one human being who has never ceased to watch over you, who thinks only of you, who makes your happiness her only care, and who would sacrifice her life to preserve yours. Edmund's heart beat, and his cheeks glowed as he exclaimed, And this kind friend is now before you, interrupted the monk, tearing aside the cloak which shrouded his companion and discovering Rosabella. Rosabella! exclaimed Edmund, a slight shade of disappointment passing over his features. "'Oh, Edmund!' cried Rosabella, throwing herself at his feet. "'Can you forget that I have overstepped the bounds prescribed to my sex? Will you not hate me?' "'I do not blame you. I were unworthy of the name of man if I could. But, father, what says Elvira? Have you delivered the chain? She refuses either to see or hear from you.' Cruel woman, but perhaps she dreads to see me. I know not, but she treated your petition with contempt. Tell him, said she, it is not possible he can have aught to say that can interest me. I will not hear his suit. Proud, haughty princess, but was this all? No, I again entreated her to see you when she turned from me in scorn, and bade me leave her. "'Talk not to me of Edmund,' cried she, with a look of ineffable contempt. "'Has he not wounded Ferdinand, and would you have me forgive him? "'A thousand deaths are not sufficient to punish such a crime.' "'What strange infatuation!' "'Strange, indeed, for she has interrupted his trial and set him free. "'Besides which, they say she has actually offered her hand, and he has refused it. Yet. Still she dotes upon him to destruction. Go, continued she, when I had finished all I had to say, and tell Edmund that I neither hate nor despise him, for he is incapable of exciting any emotion in my breast. However, if he wishes to make amends for this past conduct and be restored to my favour, his first step must be humbly to beg pardon of the prince. Damnation! cried Edmund, starting up fiercely. She did not, surely she could not say that. Indeed she did, my lord. Then may ten thousand curses light upon me if I forgive her. 
pardon of that wretch my slave my prisoner no sooner would i expire in horrid torments sooner be torn asunder by wild beasts pardon of that boy oh she could not mean it whilst edmund thus raved father morris and rosabella watched his torments with much of the same coolness as a french philosopher would those of an unfortunate animal upon which he was trying experiments no feeling of compassion entered their souls and they only waited to see the effect their words would produce it may easily be perceived that the whole scene with father morris related as having passed between him and elvira was a fabrication but lord edmund so not this for jealousy often throws a veil upon the eyes of its victims which gives a delusive colouring to everything they see thus lord edmund believed every word the father uttered and his whole frame trembled with agitation as he paced the room with hasty strides at last he threw himself upon a chair beg his pardon exclaimed he oh elvira elvira and he hid his face in his hands whilst the big tears trickled through his fingers and lord edmund the stern courageous soldier the philosopher the hero and the statesman wept actually wept like a feeble child oh edmund exclaimed rosabella approaching him and taking his hand i cannot bear to see you in distress would to heaven that by the sacrifice even of my life i could relieve you rosabella you will drive me to destruction not for worlds edmund on the contrary were i mistress of worlds i would cast them at your feet i know it i know it but spare me now spare you edmund spare what spare my reproaches mean you alas you need not fear them am i not devoted to you is it not for your sake that i have thus passed the boundaries of my sex are you disgusted with my boldness but no you will surely forgive me for my only motive has been to save you and my only hope of happiness is bound up in yours rosabella repeated edmund i believe that you love me love you oh heavens can you doubt my love i do not doubt it and this last action proves it more than words i have long done you injustice can you forgive me rosabella oh edmund exclaimed the princess whilst her full heart heaved almost to bursting and the tears streamed down her face i have been the victim of infatuation continued edmund i have loved a false and grateful woman who has betrayed me but i see my folly and if tears of penitence shed at your feet can earn my pardon if you will accept a broken bleeding heart oh edmund interrupted rosabella throwing herself into his arms say no more i am yours yours for ever your devoted slave not my slave rosabella said edmund gently disengaging her from him and placing her upon a chair but my wife my beloved wife your wife exclaimed rosabella edmund's wife am i indeed so blessed oh no surely it is a dream a fond delusive dream you cannot surely be serious is this a moment for jesting asked edmund calmly it certainly is not said father morris whose agitation had been nearly equal to their own and who had stood gazing upon them with looks of the fondest affection we must immediately escape or it will be too late it wants but two hours of daybreak and with the dawn lord edmund's trial will commence true true cried rosabella i had forgotten dearest edmund you must condescend to fly or your precious life will be sacrificed but how shall i escape through this panel a balloon waits at a little distance and this cloak will conceal your person from observation dear rosabella come come cried father morris we have no time to lose though ferdinand was acquitted you must fall for the state requires a victim lord edmund waited for no more the name of ferdinand was torture to him and hastily disencumbering himself of his chains 
he followed the father and Rosabella from the prison. He sighed, however, and looked back for a moment with regret ere he quitted the outer walls, for he thought of Elvira. Rosabella's quick ear caught the sigh, and her subtle spirit divined its meaning. But this was not a moment to complain, and stepping into their balloon they were soon out of sight of London. They proceeded to a palace of Rosabella's a few miles out of town, and there the following day Edmund became her husband. In the meantime the excessive agitation Elvira experienced on the day of Prince Ferdinand's trial brought on a return of her fever, and it was several weeks ere she was sufficiently recovered to leave her bed. When she did so, however, she was really shocked at the state in which she found her kingdom. When she first began to reign, carried away by the enthusiasm of the moment, she had taken too much of the executive part of the government upon herself, and as her illness had been too sudden to allow her to appoint a regency, no one knew who ought to supply her place. All, therefore, was confusion and disorder, and Elvira shrunk disgusted from the chaos before her. She had now no Edmund to smooth the way for her, and the native energy of her mind was gone. Pale, heart-broken, and dispirited, she felt languid and incapable of the slightest exertion. What had formerly been a pleasure was now become an overwhelming burden, and the weight of life seemed insupportable. She was now weary also of the fatigue necessary to carry on the plans she had projected for the benefit of her people. At first, when all seemed new and delightful, she had devoted herself entirely to their interests. She had denied herself even the most trifling pleasures, and scarcely allowed herself the time absolute necessary for food and rest. This was all very well, whilst her plans had the charm of novelty, and were supported by passion but now that novelty had worn off, and they had assumed the dull, wearisome appearance of duties, when repeated disappointments had extinguished almost the hope of success, and when she found her people expected, nay, demanded as a right, that which she had originally granted them only as an especial mark of favour, she discovered, though too late, the folly of the toils she had imposed upon herself she now also discovered that improvement to be effectual must be slow the people don't like to be forced out of old habits till they have seen the effect of new ones proved by experience and that nothing is so difficult as to improve people against their wills increase the resources of a country throw money into the hands of the middling and lower classes and they will improve themselves but at least nine-tenths of a population will never suffer themselves to be improved those only who have attempted this thankless and painful office can fully estimate the sufferings of the unfortunate elvira who disappointed in all she undertook found life become tasteless and insipid and was completely wretched though surrounded by all the gifts of beauty power and fortune everything seemed to conspire to increase her misery those whom she raised from indigence to affluence treated her with the most provoking insolence and discontent a plan which had been opposed by the lords gustavus de montfort and maysworth and which she had persisted in having tried had completely failed and the noble lords had triumphed in the most provoking manner in her disappointment in short everything went wrong and elvira disgusted with the world felt mortified and disgusted with herself how hard it is thought she frequently as she tossed upon her sleepless couch that i who since my accession to the throne have devoted myself entirely to the interests of my subjects should be thus wretched whilst tyrants who live but to oppress sleep quietly upon their beds of down alas why cannot i be as they are why cannot i divest myself of reflection and enjoy the pleasures which surround me but what pleasures can i enjoy alas the world presents nothing that can interest me an insipid vacuum spreads through all creation my heart is cold and desolate my affections are thrown back upon myself and i am miserable thus raved elvira and absorbed in painful meditations 
she neglected the duties of her station and resigned herself to despair whilst the people attributing her evident wretchedness to her grief for the absence of prince ferdinand who had left london immediately after his trial and had not since been heard of became every hour more and more discontented with their queen in the meantime the marriage of lord edmund though not openly avowed was generally suspected and the party of rosabella gained strength every day whilst mysterious rumours were whispered from mouth to mouth and diverse hints given that many knew more than they chose to say though from the immense number of these mystery mongers it seemed as in the celebrated scene in the barber of seville that every one was in the secret which nobody was to divulge the listlessness of elvira soon produced the most serious effect a kingdom without a government or rather a government without a chief cannot long go on well it is like a ship at sea without a pilot and it must founder upon the first rock which impedes its course when the vigour of government is from any cause relaxed there are always plenty of persons ready to take advantage of the opportunity afforded them to commit evil with impunity and crimes of every description multiplied so fast under the negligent sway of elvira that the people became clamorous in their complaints but to whom could they address themselves the queen was rarely visible lord edmund was gone and the lords of the council were too busy talking about the interests of the people to think of really attending to them whilst the duke and sir ambrose seemed too old to be likely to trouble themselves by intermeddling with an affair of state to them however the people looked as a dernier resort and as it seemed indelicate to apply to the duke when the person they complained of was his own daughter they entreated sir ambrose to present a petition to the queen in their behalf the worthy baronet acceded to their request and though almost bent to the earth by age and misery prepared once more to appear at court the loss of his beloved edmund had affected the old man deeply he considered his fight before trial as a confession of guilt and the thought of disgrace weighed down his great hairs with sorrow to the grave the distress of the people however roused him from the apathy into which he was fast falling and when he waited upon the queen it was with all the energy of his former years the queen received him sullenly i cannot help it sir ambrose said she i am sorry for my people but I cannot do anything to relieve them. I feel that I am fast sinking into the tomb. Do not then disturb my last moments by fruitless solicitations. Last moments, cried Sir Ambrose indignantly. Rally your energies, and you may live half a century. You give way to the morbid sensibility which oppresses you, and, because some of your hopes have been disappointed, you shrink from the duties you have imposed upon yourself and talk of your last moments shame shame elvira rouse yourself from this lethargy and be indeed a queen remember that though nature has ordinarily denied your sex the power of triumphing in the field she has yet left a far greater conquest for you to achieve the conquest of yourselves for it is far more glorious to subdue the wayward desires of the human heart than to lead a score of monarchs captives in your chains struggle then with your feelings conquer those fatal passions which threaten to destroy you show yourself worthy of your crown and be again the elvira for whom even in her childhood i anticipated greatness it is too late interrupted the queen impatiently it is now too late urge me no more sir ambrose or you will drive me to despair sir ambrose was provoked with her obstinacy and a pause ensued which was broken by a tumultuous noise and shouting it was the people at the gates of the palace who impatient at the length of sir ambrose's stay were now becoming clamorous for an answer what shall i say to them asked the baronet tell them i deny their suit replied the queen away 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 i would be quiet go without reply i will hear no more i will not be tormented and waving her hand for him to depart she hurried to her chamber finding there was no alternative sir ambrose was compelled to appear before the people and acquaint them with the will of their sovereign the tumult became more violent as he spoke an english mob is proverbially impetuous and now their rage rose beyond control 
the queen the queen they shouted we will see the queen the crowd increased every moment the multitude heaved in tremendous waves like the rolling billows of the sea and the hum of thousands of human voices filled the air they threatened to storm the palace a man in complete armour his face entirely concealed by his visor headed their attempts the outer gates were forced and the throng rushed tumultuously into the court of the palace all there was confusion soldiers might have been summoned and the place defended but there was no one to give orders and the servants ran to and fro in the greatest possible distress without knowing either where they were going or what they intended doing in the midst of this bustle elvira sat burying her face in her hands and obstinately refusing to take the slightest interest in the scene the door opened violently and sir ambrose and some of her principal servants rushed in for god's sake save yourself cried they if your majesty were safe we cared not for ourselves fly cried sir ambrose throwing himself upon his knees before her his white hair streaming almost to the ground for god's sake fly it was too late however then had the queen been disposed to obey him for as he spoke the outer door burst open with tremendous violence the palace seemed to shake to its foundation with a shock and in an instant the chamber was filled by the infuriated populace seize the queen but do not injure her cried a voice that thrilled through every nerve of sir ambrose spare the old man do not hurt a hair of his head sir ambrose looked up the voice came from the man in armour but it was the voice of edmund a crowd of overwhelming thoughts rushed through his mind and overpowered by their weight he sank senseless upon the ground take him away cried edmund for it was he indeed take him away but see that ye hurt him not he dies that injures him edmund cried elvira struck also by his voice to prison with her exclaimed he to prison edmund do you doom your queen to prison is it thus you treat your sovereign i owe no sovereign here but rosabella but by what right can she be called your sovereign by that which made you queen the voice of the people it lies with them to crown or to dethrone oh edmund mercy away with her i'll hear no more the guards seized upon the unfortunate elvira and in spite of her entreaties hurried her away edmund did not trust himself to look at her for a moment he hid his face in his hands then rousing himself he exclaimed now to proclaim the queen the people followed him with shouts of applause and before evening edmund and rosabella were unanimously acknowledged as king and queen of england End of chapter five of volume three volume three chapter six part one of the mummy a tale of the twenty-second century this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Mummy, A Tale of the Twenty-Second Century by Jane Loudon. Volume 3, Chapter 6, Part 1. Notwithstanding the able manner in which the revolution had been effected, England was still in a state of tumult. Though the army had been seduced by the example of Edmund, and the people had been obliged to submit they were by no means perfectly satisfied with their new government and rosabella found too late that though the throne might be compared to a bed of roses it was not without its thorns the discontented nobles who had aided her cause were also extremely displeased by what they called the trifling value of the rewards bestowed upon them though in fact they rated their services so high that rosabella found her whole kingdom did not possess the power of repaying them to their satisfaction it was also a considerable grievance of these haughty nobles to see prince ferdinand return to the english court immediately after the dethronement of elvira and be received with open arms by rosabella who with the anxiety to conciliate the friendship of foreign powers usually displayed by those whose thrones feel far from secure at home loaded him with favours and even gave him a post of honour in the command of her own bodyguard 
whilst the unreasonableness of her people thus embittered rosabella's political life her domestic happiness seemed to rest upon a yet more unstable foundation she knew that though she possessed edmund's hand his heart was still devoted to elvira and jealousy made her view all his actions in a distorted light if he were sad she was sure he was thinking of her rival and if gay she fancied it a mask put on only to deceive her she was thus completely miserable and edmund was as wretched as herself he felt that he had sacrificed himself to revenge and sold his peace for a bauble which when obtained did not seem worth the trouble of possessing his father too sir ambrose his doting father was now entirely estranged from him as he repeatedly declared he would never forgive a traitor who could forget his oath of allegiance for his own aggrandizement no exclaimed the old man i loved i doted upon edmund but the edmund i loved is vanished my darling son was brave and noble not a deceptive scoundrel no no my old heart may break nay i hope it will but never whilst i live shall a deceitful traitor be pressed against this breast edmund was inconsolable he passionately loved his father and could not bear his anger besides he felt that the reproaches of the old man were seconded by those of his own heart it is painful at any time to bear the censures of the world but they fall with double weight when we know we have deserved them edmund was dissatisfied with himself and consequently disposed to quarrel with the world he fancied it looked coldly upon him and in return he affected to despise it a hundred times a day he repeated that he was perfectly indifferent to everything that was said of him whilst his nervous anxiety to peruse the newspapers and make himself perfectly acquainted with every popular rumour proved that he was only too sensible to every word that was uttered edmund had made the mob his idol he could not live without its applauses and wretched indeed are those who thus depend on others for their hopes of happiness edmund's disgust of his new rank and situation was soon still further increased by a visit from lord gustavus who with several other lords was deputed to present to his majesty the complaints of the commons they wanted to be enfranchised they desired innumerable rights and privileges and in fact they wanted to be all kings for if half that they demanded had been granted edmund must have made them more powerful than himself he pointed this out to lord gustavus and condescended to reason with him upon the folly of their desires impossible cried lord gustavus your majesty must excuse me but i cannot listen to such arguments i came here to defend the liberties of the people reform is necessary without reform nothing can go on well evils must be torn up root and branch are not my subjects healthy wealthy and prosperous asked edmund have they not been successful at home and abroad do not the english peasants live as well as most foreign princes and what more can they require liberty sire returned lord gustavus what are all these pretended advantages without liberty mere toys gaudy apples but rotten at the core of what use indeed are all the blessings of life without liberty to give them zest and radical reform to purge them of all impurities but listen to reason reason thinking as i think and as i am sure every rational being must think or at least ought to think your majesty must forgive me if i assert that even reason herself does not deserve to be attended to when she is barely enlisted upon the side of tyranny nay then said edmund it is useless to attempt to argue with you i thought you had made reason your goddess but if you worship her only as long as it suits your own purposes i have done you may retire i shall take the petition into consideration and give it an answer when i may think fit edmund who from being degraded and debased in his own opinion no longer possessed that confidence in himself which had formerly carried conviction with all he said had yet sufficient dignity in his manner to owe those to silence who dared to dispute his commands and lord gustavus and his colleagues 
not presuming to make further remonstrance, retired in dudgeon. This incident contributed to sicken Edmund of reigning. He became disgusted with his queen, his court, his kingdom, and his country, and secluding himself as much as possible from public life, left the care of managing the affairs of state to Rosabella and Father Morris, who now, throwing off the disguise he so long had worn, appeared openly as the dispenser of her favours and the arbiter of her actions. The spirit of poor Sir Ambrose was quite broken by these misfortunes. The defection of his son and the ingratitude of his friend's confessor stung him to the core. He retired again to the country, where with his friend the Duke, Clara, and Father Murphy, he contrived to exist, though but the shadow of his former self. The Duke was also grievously changed, and it was melancholy to see these two poor old men wandering about their splendid gardens and magnificent palaces like roaming ghosts, permitted to revisit for a time the scenes of their departed happiness. Clara now became the sole stay that bound these old men to life. Her character had developed itself wonderfully in the midst of the striking events she had witnessed. Firm, courageous, and enterprising, though still gentle, the lively girl seemed changed into the intelligent woman, whose active mind and comprehensive spirit foresaw everything and provided against every emergency. Clara was still young. But her spirit was mature beyond her years, and her attention to the Duke and Sir Ambrose was unremitting. Well, would they often say, though we have lost much, we ought still to be thankful that Clara is spared to us. And then, with tears trickling down their aged cheeks, they would join in imploring heaven to shower down blessings upon her head. In the meantime, Clara herself was far from happy. She would, it is true, exert herself to appear cheerful, but it was evident it was an exertion and often, when the Duke and Sir Ambrose had seated themselves to a party at chess, she would steal out unobserved and retire to a little pavilion in the Duke's garden, near what were formerly the apartments of Father Morris, as being the most secluded spot she could find, this part of the mansion having been carefully shut up and avoided by every human being since the departure of the priest as infectious. The indignation that the worthy and attached servants of his grace felt towards father morris for his desertion of their master being extended even to the rooms he had occupied in this secluded spot clara often sat for hours lost in meditation her head resting upon her hand and her eyes fixed on vacancy winter had now given place to spring and all nature seemed to revive with that gay and joyous season but the heart of clara was still lonely she fancied it could enjoy no second summer, and she felt almost disposed to quarrel with all around her for displaying a gaiety in which she could not participate. Nothing makes a broken heart feel more gloomy than to see all other objects look gay. It turns from them in disgust, and feels its own misery doubled by the sight of their happiness. One evening, as Clara was sitting absorbed in melancholy reflections, she was startled by hearing a deep-drawn sigh heaved heavily behind her. She turned and fancied she could distinguish a figure in the midst of the twilight, but, magnified by the obscurity, the figure seemed of gigantic proportions. Uttering a faint scream, she attempted to fly, when a hand of iron grasped her arm and arrested her progress. An icy chill shot to her heart, whilst the well-remembered voice of Cheops sounded in her ears clara said he in his deep sepulchral tone would you save your queen with a sacrifice of my life if necessary replied clara firmly clara continued the mummy i have marked you attentively and as i do not know an individual possessing more strength of mind and personal courage than yourself I have fixed upon you to be my attendant in this enterprise. The life of Elvira is in danger, and even my influence cannot much longer save her if she remain in the power of Father Morris. Besides, the lesson she has already had has been sufficiently severe. I will aid her to escape, and you must assist me. 
you shall go to ireland and there if the warlike roderick be not deaf to the cry of beauty in distress through his aid elvira may hope redress at least she must implore his help rosabella is now at a palace near this and she has brought her rival in her train for with the usual jealousy and suspicion of tyrants and usurpers she scarcely dares to trust her from her sight besides this her diabolical revenge is gratified in making elvira wait humbly near her throne and serve in those palaces where she once commanded moved by this ungenerous conduct and the patience with which the unhappy elvira bears her sufferings the nobles and people of the realm begin to pity her and when they are disgusted with the haughtiness and intolerance of rosabella they sigh for the return of the gentle elvira father morris perceives this and determining to rid rosabella of her rival the fair elvira fades beneath his arts like a flower withering on its stem she must be saved said clara with enthusiasm she shall be saved point but out the means and i am devoted to her service you must assume these weeds and follow me said cheops pointing to a bundle in a corner of the pavilion which clara had not before noticed in half an hour i will return for you and my sudden disappearance rejoined clara will it not excite suspicion the river which runs through the grounds is deep and rapid returned cheops some of your clothes left upon its banks i comprehend cried clara eagerly but the poor old duke and sir ambrose their anxiety and distress may be great but cannot be lasting the feelings of age are blunt and oh no exclaimed clara you are deceived for age feels grief more acutely than youth the mind has lost its elasticity hope is dead within it and the old brood over their secret sorrows till they pine gradually away by osiris thou art the most extraordinary girl said cabs the old do brood over grief but why say this to me do i not know it well too well continued he looking at her earnestly clara turned pale and trembled for the hideous countenance of the mummy when distorted by human passions was almost too much for mortals to behold and leave cheops saw her agitation and hastily averting his eyes continued in a calmer tone whatever the sufferings of the old man may be for the moment i suppose even you will allow the life of elvira more than counterbalances them and by inflicting this temporary pain you will save them from the more lasting agony they would endure from her death for father morris is so subtle that it would be dangerous to give them the slightest hint of our intention lest he should warm it from them be ready then clara resign thyself to my instructions and above all fear not clara bent her head in token of assent and cabs disappeared upon examining the clothes clara found them to be the dress of a greek peasant boy numbers of whom at this period were rambling over england singing wild romances to their harps or lutes and telling fortunes in a kind of doggerel rhyme exposure to the air turned most of these wandering minstrels brown and clara found a bottle of liquid in the parcel to stain her face and hands she bound up her flaxen ringlets and covering her head with curls of a jetty blackness she found the metamorphosis so complete that she scarcely knew herself as she saw her figure reflected in a large mirror behind her it was now nearly dark but cabs had left the necessary implements for striking a light and clara made her toilet without the least difficulty anxious were the moments however which passed after her task was completed till the arrival of cabs and when he did come she saw he was attired as herself he grasped her arm and without speaking led her to the banks of the river clara shuddered when she found herself alone in the power of the mysterious being and saw the river all deep and dark beneath her feet cheops felt her shudder and cried with one of his horrid laughs which sounded fearfully amidst the stillness of the night what 
do even you fear me is there no courage in this degenerate race none what do you fear if you dread to trust yourself in my power or think yourself unequal to the task you have undertaken retire there is yet time and i wish no unwilling agents poor child continued he looking at her with feeling thou dost not know me but for worlds i would not harm thee i will go with you said clara resolutely i do not shrink let what will await me i will not recede though unheard-of torments may attend me i will endure them by the holy gods of my forefathers cried Caeps, she is a brave girl yes clara i will trust thee and though we should encounter horrors fearful as those which menace the initiati in the dread i see and mysteries i will not doubt thy courage a determined spirit clara may subdue even fate as he spoke he threw the clothes she had brought for the purpose carelessly upon the banks of the river and then again seizing her arm he dragged her forward with such rapidity that in an incredible short time they approached the palace of rosabella the mansion looked the region of enchantment brilliantly illuminated light streamed from every window and through the colonnade of the great hall groups of elegantly dressed people were seen moving gaily to and fro some dancing and others listening to harmonious music clara though terrified and exhausted felt still irresistibly impelled to proceed and still guided by her strange companion entered unobserved the outer court of the palace prince ferdinand of germany commands the guard to-night whispered Caeps in a low unnatural voice it is well he shall go with us but will he asked clara tremblingly will he returned Caeps with his peculiar sneer dost thou doubt my power girl clara and Caeps had now reached a place from whence unobserved they could survey the whole of the splendid apartment before them they had in fact entered the hall and placed themselves in a kind of recess shaded by projecting pillars from whence they could see every part of the saloon clara was astonished to find herself so easily in the presence of the queen for she knew not how they had attained their present situation and she would have spoken to ask Caeps, but he laid his finger upon his lips and whispering hippocrates was the only son of isis and osiris she comprehended he meant that wisdom and knowledge produced silence and she did not dare to breathe the syllable rosabella sat upon a splendid dais gorgeously attired her black eyes flashing with added brilliancy from the deep rouge upon her cheeks while her raven hair was adorned with diamonds and a splendid tiara of the same precious stones sparkled on her forehead a robe of crimson velvet bordered with ermine fell in graceful folds upon her fine figure whilst her swan-like neck and snowy arms exposed perhaps more than delicacy might strictly warrant were also loaded with costly jewels around her stood the ladies of her court and amongst the rest elvira plainly attired in a robe of dark grey silk no ornaments shone amongst her golden tresses and her naturally fair complexion seemed faded to a sickly and unnatural whiteness the indignation of clara could scarcely be restrained at this sight but Caeps laying his hand upon her arm they stood suddenly before the queen ah who are these cried rosabella starting Caeps took no notice of his surprise but tuning his lute began to sing a few doggerel verses in praise of her majesty clara's astonishment and awe now surpassed description her sense of personal identity became confused she could scarcely fancy that it was really the hideous mummy who was her companion her senses swam her head became giddy and she could scarcely keep herself from fainting what means this mummery asked rosabella how came these minstrels here it is doubtless a device of the king returned some of her ladies to amuse your majesty rosabella smiled attentions were now so rare upon the part of edmund towards her that she felt gratified it should be even supposed he wished to please her and addressing the minstrel more graciously asked what brought him to england he sung his reply and in the same doggerel rhyme asked the queen to let him tell her fortune what say you ladies 
said rosabella again smiling shall we hear our destiny the ladies delighted with anything that promised an interruption to the general gloom which hung over rosabella's court gladly assented and to clara's infinite surprise the mummy addressed a few doggerel verses to each whilst the voice in which he repeated this nonsense was so different from his usual deep sepulchral tones that clara's wonder became mixed with fear and she shuddered with horror as the conviction that the being with whom she had associated herself was indeed a demon flashed across her mind when elvira's turn came clara perceived her colour was heightened and that she trembled excessively yet the mummy's verses to her were as unmeaning as to the rest whilst this scene was passing the king and father morris approached the former stood silent and abstracted apparently quite unconscious of the group before him whilst father morris gazed at them intently with a satirical sneer upon his countenance as though in thorough contempt for such folly how can you endure such mummery said he to rosabella after a short pause anything for a change said she sighing the father's dark eye glanced upon the king and then upon rosabella as with a gloomy frown he stalked on the queen coloured and hastily waving her hand to the minstrel as a sign that he might depart she turned away and the disappointed ladies were reluctantly obliged to follow in her train in a few minutes a page returned with a chain and a purse of gold which he gave the minstrels and retired clara was upon the point of refusing her share of this bounty but a look from the mummy made her sensible of her error and she took it without uttering a syllable her hesitation however did not pass unnoticed and she found to her infinite horror when they quitted the palace that two of the queen's servants had followed them clara trembled excessively and clung tightly to the mummy's arm for protection but that mysterious being still stalked on with the same indifference as before clara longed to give him some intimation of the danger which awaited him but she could not speak the words seemed to swell in her throat and almost choke her whilst she found herself dragged along by an irresistible influence too powerful to admit of her even struggling against it inexpressible agony seized her as she found herself hurried on towards the river and when as they reached the brink she beheld Caeb's stamp with supernatural force upon the fragile bridge which stretched across the water and saw the slender plank sink beneath his weight she could bear no more but screaming with horror rushed forward to save him a strong arm however pulled her back she felt herself whirled round and for the moment her senses seemed to desert her the next instant she found she had been dragged under some bushes and so their pursuers rushed down to the place where the broken bridge had been they are gone by jupiter said one i heard them fall into the water it was a tremendous crush i heard them too returned the other they fell as heavy as lead and how they screamed the young one screamed said the first but the old one groaned what does it matter resumed the second whether they screamed or groaned they are gone to the devil a little before their time and so we have only to go back as we came between ourselves it was nonsense to take the trouble to watch them they were evidently only what they seemed to be and even father morris suspicious as he is gave us no orders about them thy dull head cannot see said the first the father's negligence was the very motive of my vigilance things are not with him as they have been he wants to rule the queen with a rod of iron and rosabella will not endure control now it struck me when i saw the youth's hesitation that all was not right and i thought if i could discover what had escaped him i see said the other his lifeless trunk might have had the honour of serving as a stepping-stone to enable you to rise it was possible returned the other laughing and they retired their voices gradually dying away till they became inaudible in the distance clara now perceived that the mummy stood beside her he did not speak but pressed his finger upon his lips in token of silence and for some minutes they stood fixed to the spot till as the last faint echo of the servant's footsteps died away he again seized the arm of clara and hurried her away towards a gloomy cave they stopped at the entrance 
and though the poor girl was still too much terrified to speak yet she felt somewhat relieved by the discovery that the mummy had evidently saved her from danger instead of as she feared precipitating her into it she still gazed with awe however at his strange unearthly figure as he stood with his eyes fixed earnestly upon a star apparently occupied in muttering prayers addressed to it End of chapter six part one of volume three Volume three chapter six part two of the mummy a tale of the twenty second century this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the mummy a tale of the twenty second century by jane loudon volume three chapter six part two clara at length said he his deep full voice echoing solemnly through the vaulted cave clara again he repeated whilst the blood of his terrified companion seemed to curdle in her veins at the awful sound she slowly and tremblingly advanced he grasped her arm she attempted to shrink back but seemed fixed as though by magic hear me continued the mummy in a low hollow tone which appeared to rise from the tomb and contrasted fearfully with the lighter accents he had employed as a minstrel elvira understood my signal and she will soon be here but you must do the rest prince ferdinand keeps guard to-night pass through this cave the outlet will bring you to his station throw yourself at his feet and appeal to his compassion in whatever language the feeling of the moment may inspire he will readily listen to you for he has not forgotten your visit to him in prison and will swear to devote himself to your service tell him you accept his offers and entreat him to convey yourself and the queen to ireland where roderick will receive and protect you he will immediately comply and his being the companion of your flight will induce the belief that you are gone to germany and will consequently prevent the least danger of pursuit at this moment a slight figure wrapped in a large mantle appeared at the entrance of the cavern elvira cried caebs and the stranger sprang forward then i am right exclaimed she whilst her whole frame trembled with agitation this is your guide said caebs in his deep sepulchral tone follow her and you will do well farewell we shall never meet again then bending over her he pressed his lips to her forehead and to that of clara both shuddered at the touch of those cold marble lips and an icy chill ran through their veins as the fearful conviction that their companion was no earthly being thrilled in their bosoms even the strongest minds dread supernatural horrors and their fair fugitives turned involuntarily away when they looked again the mummy was gone and the darkness appeared so profound that they were obliged to grope their way cautiously along fearing alike to remain or to advance they proceeded with trembling steps slowly along a narrow passage their minds filled with that vague sense of danger which generally attends the want of light when imagination pictures terrors that do not really exist and fancy lends her aid to magnify those which do by degrees however the queen and her companion became accustomed to the darkness and as the pupils of their eyes dilated they were enabled to discern the objects around them innumerable fantastic shapes now appeared to flit before them and grim giants to frown awfully from every corner of the gloomy vault they were traversing the dim and indistinct light threw a misty veil round the projecting corners of the rocks which gave them a fearful and unnatural grandeur whilst the fair friends overpowered with terror gazed timidly around and stood a few moments not daring to advance into the darker abysses of the caverns and yet dreading alike to remain where they were or to return we must go on said elvira at length her voice echoing through the cave till she started at the sound oh god cried clara hark 
a thousand mocking demons seemed to repeat from every rock go on go on again rang in a thousand varied tones through the cavern let us proceed whispered elvira shuddering this is a fearful place and they hurried on as fast as their trembling limbs could carry them along a dark and gloomy passage leading in the direction pointed out by the mummy in a few minutes a bright though glimmering light appeared afar off like a star which gleaming through the darkness seemed a beacon of hope to guide them on to happiness a slight current of air too now blew freshly in their faces and their spirits rose as with quickened steps they hastened onward in the direction from whence it appeared to proceed the light now seemed rapidly to enlarge and the wind blew more freshly whilst the queen and her companion distinctly heard the heavy stamping of horses which vibrated fearfully on the hollow ground and grew louder and louder every moment as they advanced ah what is that cried elvira trembling clinging closer to her companion it is the bivouac of prince ferdinand replied clara the mummy told me we should find him here and that he should aid us ah that fearful mummy murmured elvira softly if he should deceive us and this should be only a plan to betray us to our enemies fear not said clara come what may we must dare the worst they had now reached the outlet of the cavern and found an opening large enough to admit of a single person cautiously advancing towards it they paused for a few moments ere they descended to gaze upon the scene below a troop of soldiers were scattered round in various attitudes of repose under a small grove of trees whilst their horses grazed at a little distance the prince alone seemed awake and he lay apart from his companions stretched upon a grassy bank a thick tree spreading above him, his head resting upon his hand, and his eyes fixed upon the ground. The moon shone brightly, and played upon the prince's polished armour, like summer lightning dancing on a lake. His helmet was thrown aside, and his countenance looked pale and sad, whilst his frequent sighs betrayed the uneasiness of his mind. "'Let us advance,' said Clara, "'and try to move him to compassion.' Elvira complied and with light and timid steps, fearing almost to breathe, lest they should break the slumbers of their enemies, they approached the prince. All was still, save the hard breathing of the sleeping soldiers, and the measured champings of the horses. Their stately figures, strongly relieved by the dark grey sky beyond, whilst their long manes and tails swept the ground. The prince was now listlessly tracing figures in the grass with the scabbard of his sword, he started as they approached, and hastily demanded the cause of their intrusion. "'Mercy!' cried Elvira, sinking upon her knees before him. "'Mercy!' She could say no more, but gasping for breath, she stretched out her arms imploringly, whilst everything around seemed to swim before her eyes, and the figures of the prince, the trees, the horses, and the sleeping soldiers appeared all dilated to gigantic magnitude. She entirely forgot the pathetic appeal she had intended making to the prince's feelings, and every faculty seemed suspended in the intenseness of her anxiety. "'For heaven's sake, good youth!' exclaimed the prince, addressing Clara. "'Explain the meaning of this scene. Why does this lovely female kneel to me, and why does she implore my mercy?' "'Because she has no other hope, saving that in heaven,' said Clara solemnly. "'It is the queen.' "'Elvira!' cried the prince then raising her eagerly he continued your majesty may command my services and i am most happy fate has given me an opportunity of showing my gratitude only tell me how i can assist you a few words from clara explained the urgency of their situation and the prince promising to meet them with horses in an hour persuaded them to return to the cavern till he should join them heavily rolled the minutes of this tedious hour which seemed destined never to have an end, till the nerves of Elvira and Clara were wrought up to such a pitch of agony that death would have appeared a blessing. At length the prince came, bringing with him only his faithful hands. The sight of him was sufficient to rouse the almost fainting spirits of the queen, and without speaking a single word, she and Clara hurried after their conductors to the wood where the horses were waiting for them. They mounted, 
still in perfect silence, and hurried through the most intricate paths they could find, for, as morning dawned, they feared inevitable destruction. Before it became quite light, however, they had reached a thick wood, near the centre of which they found a half-ruined hut, and here did the ci de vin Queen of England and her suite try to obtain a few hours' repose. But, alas, sleep fled from Elvira's eyes. She could not forget she was a fugitive in her own kingdom, flying with terror from those very people who, but a few months before, had almost worshipped her as a goddess and not even the exhaustion of her body could overcome the hurry of her spirits, whilst every time she closed her eyes, and felt a soft doze creeping over her troubled senses, she started up again in horror, fancying her pursuers had overtaken her. Consternation reigned in the palace when the flight of Elvira and the defection of Prince Ferdinand were made known there. "'She is gone to Germany,' was the universal cry, and troops were directly dispatched to all the seaports, whilst a whole fleet of balloons were ordered to scour the air in all directions and arrest every aerial vehicle they should meet with, whose passengers could not give a perfectly satisfactory account of themselves. These commissions were executed to the letter, as the guards now sought by extra diligence to excuse the negligence with which they had suffered the queen to escape and numerous were the wandering lovers, absconding clerks, and unfaithful wives, who were brought before the council instead of Elvira and the German prince, of whom, however, nothing could be heard, their measures having been taken too well to expose them to detection. In the meantime, Clara being missed, the Duke and Sir Ambrose were inconsolable, and dispatched emissaries everywhere in search of her. Among the rest, Father Murphy and Ablard were sent to explore every corner of the grounds, and the disconsolate searchers, having in vain wandered through the gardens, restless and forlorn, at last arrived upon the banks of the river. The aspect of the place was dreary in the extreme. Evening was closing in. The river looked dark and dull, and Father Murphy shivered and crossed himself as he looked around. "'Oh, murder! But this is an awful place, Mr. Ablard, said he, "'and I'm after thinking the sooner we get out of it the better.' "'Ah, what is that?' cried the butler, springing forward eagerly, and snatching at something in the bushes that looked light. It was Clara's mantle. Ablard uttered a groan of horror as he recognized it, and the priest starting at the sound, his foot slipped, and he rolled into the water, floundering about like a huge porpoise. "'Oh, dear!' "'Oh, dear!' cried Ablert. "'He will certainly be drowned. Submersion in an aqueous fluid is almost always destructive of animal life, and I see little chance that he has of escape.' "'Oh! And will you let me drown while you're talking?' asked the indignant priest. "'Before it's the good-natured thing you'd be doing in pulling me out, will you let me be suffocated?' "'No, no, certainly not,' returned Ablert. My agony is unspeakable at your distress. I only doubt how I shall be able to raise you without a lever or pulley. The application of the mechanical powers— May go to the devil! cried Father Murphy as he crawled out without assistance. And so you would have let me drown, whilst you are talking of the mechanical powers? Excuse me, Father, returned Ablert. Friendship is a powerful affection of the human mind. It invigorates, it warms, does it? said the priest, shaking himself like a water-spaniel. Then I should be very glad to have a little of it at present, for I am shivering with cold. I am surprised to hear you talk of cold, father, said Ablard. You are surely too fat to feel cold, for animal oil is universally allowed to be a bad conductor of caloric. Father Murphy did not speak, but his look was sufficient, and his teeth clattering in his head afforded an ample commentary upon the text. It is strange, continued the butler, that fat people generally seem ashamed of their obesity, for they have many advantages which lean people never can enjoy. For instance, they ought never to feel any violent craving for food. Fat serving as an interdium, through which the nutritive matter extracted from food passes, before it is assimilated to repair the loss of the individual, ought to serve as a magazine to supply his wants, and a fat man should be able to abstain from food much longer than another, because during his abstinence the collected fat must be rapidly reabsorbed. Oh, groaned Father Murphy, would to heaven I had a broiled rump steak at this moment, smoking hot and swimming in gravy, and a fine frothing pot of porter. 
"'A rum steak is no bad thing,' resumed Ablard, his mouth watering at the bare mention of the savoury viand. "'And I do not wish it to be understood by any means that a man can live without eating. On the contrary, the indivisibility and individuality of the living body can only be maintained by an incessant change of the particles which enter into its composition, part of the animal food being reduced into chyle and part becoming bones, which are, in fact, only secretory organs, encrusted with phosphate of lime. The lymphatic vessels remove this salt and— "'Oh, and it's Clara you are forgetting all this while,' interrupted Father Murphy. The purty creature, sure, and it's her mantle after all, so it is. And here we are talking of stuff and nonsense, and quite forgetting she's drowned and killed all over. Poor soul! Alas, alas, returned Ablert, I have not forgotten her, and I assure you, I feel my lacrymal glands suffused, almost to overflowing whenever a thought of what may be her fate shoots across my pia mater. The despair of the Duke and Sir Ambrose when they saw their emissaries return with the clothes of Clara may be easily imagined, and when they heard of the flight of Elvira and the threats which Father Morris now openly indulged in, that the ex-queen should be publicly executed if found, for having endeavoured to raise an insurrection, the climax of their misery seemed full. In the meantime the party of Elvira did not dare to leave the hut in which they had remained pent up the whole day, their horses being crowded within its walls, as well as themselves to prevent the possibility of discovery. At length the shades of evening began to fall, and they again set forward at a rapid pace. Though the agony they had suffered all day from fear of detection, the narrow space in which they had been cooped up, together with want of food, had exhausted the queen so much that the morning found her unable to proceed without refreshment, and about daybreak they were obliged to approach a cottage to implore assistance. The cottager and his son were out at work, but the women of the house agreed to give the fugitives the shelter they requested. The prince, delighted at receiving this permission, flew back to the queen to lift her from her horse. But alas, Elvira was not in a state to enjoy even the most welcome tidings. Pale and livid as a corpse, her head hung upon the prince's shoulder as he bore her into the house, and her terrified friends thought she had expired. A little warm milk, however, revived her, and she opened her eyes. "'I am ready, quite ready to go on,' said she, gasping for utterance, and again sinking back in a fainting fit. "'It is impossible she can proceed in this state,' said the prince to Clara in a whisper. "'What will become of us?' "'We must remain here quietly, till she is better,' said Clara. "'But if we should be pursued and taken?' "'We cannot die better than in such a cause,' said the heroic girl. "'It is strange,' said the prince, looking at her earnestly, "'that the queen has been able to inspire such enthusiastic devotion in such a mere boy.' Clara blushed and cast her eyes upon the ground, whilst the prince gazed upon her blushing cheeks still more earnestly, till she turned away from him abashed. He took her hand. "'I cannot be mistaken,' said he. "'It is—' "'It is Miss Montague.' Clara's agitation betrayed her. "'I must attend the Queen,' said she, breaking from him. And the Prince, respecting the awkwardness of her situation, forbore to urge her further. He felt, however, completely happy. Clara was too artless to conceal the interest he had excited in her breast, and it was not in the nature of man to be indifferent to the devotion of so young and lovely a creature. His eyes alone expressed his happiness— and Clara, who felt his delicacy in refraining from making any further observations on her disguise, found her love for him increased tenfold by his forbearance. A few hours' repose restored Elvira so much that she wished to pursue her journey immediately, and it was with the greatest difficulty that the prince persuaded her to wait till nightfall. "'You must recruit your strength,' said he, "'or you will never be able to plead your cause with the redoubtable Roderick.' He is too stern a hero to be worn as I was. Oh, it is impossible to describe how I dread to meet him, cried Elvira. I tremble at his name. A being so fierce and stern as he is will perhaps not even condescend to listen to a woman's prayer, and he will spurn me from him. Impossible, cried the prince, though I own I wish we could do without him. Whilst the principals were thus employed, the cottager's wife was endeavouring to learn from Hans who and what they were. That poor lady seemed dreadfully tired, 
said she. When she came, she looked just like a drooping daffodown dilly. When the gentleman lifted her from her horse, oh, it was quite moving to see her. Yeah, said Hans. However, though her illness should occasion a little delay, continued the cottager, I opine that you must be unreasonable to grumble, when you consider the delightful occasion it affords you of refreshing your olfactory nerves by partaking of a little of this odoriferous atmosphere. My what nerves? asked Hans. Your olfactory nerves, replied the learned cottager, with a look of the greatest possible contempt, that is the nerves that line the membrane of the nasal organ. Every child knows that the nasal fossae are formed to receive sensations, as by their depth and extent a larger surface is given to the pituitary membrane, and these soft sinuses or cavities are enabled to retain a greater mass of air loaded with odoriferous matter. Poor Hans stood aghast at this explanation, which he found something like that said to be given by Dr. Johnson, when he called network a complicated concatenation of rectangular angles, and afraid to speak, lest he should draw upon himself a new volley of words, as astounding as the last, he remained silent, staring at his companions with much the same kind of feeling as that with which a wild man of the woods, just caught, might be supposed to gaze upon enlightened Europeans. "'Can you give me some more warm milk?' asked Clara, who now descended in search of refreshments for the Queen. "'Do you think so much of the tepid luxurious fluid good for the lady?' asked the cottager, as she put some milk into a saucepan. "'She can take nothing else,' returned Clara. "'How delightfully that girl sings!' continued she, listening with rapture to a milkmaid, who was chanting in Italian bravura as she was milking her cow. Yes, replied the cottager. Angelica sings well. The parieties of her larynx are in a very tense condition, and her trachea is quite cartilaginous. But here comes my good man, continued she. He has been hard at work all day in the roads, and I am sure he must want some refreshment. I do indeed feel excessive lassitude, missus, said the cottager as he came in and I want something to eat. What have you got? Do see, will you, for it's dreadful hard work breaking stones. Most we had to-day were primitive limestone, but I found a few fine specimens of quartz. The crystals were quite rhomboidal, and I stopped at least half an hour admiring them. Rock crystals are often found among squads, said his wife, so I don't think you had any occasion to lose your time in admiring them when you know you break stones by measure, and your wife and children are starving for want of bread. Do not distress yourself upon that head, my good woman, said Clara. We have money, and our gratitude will not permit you to want anything that we can give you. Thank you, thank you, cried the woman. It's a pleasure to serve a generous gentleman like your honour. What a charming voice you have! said clara turning away to avoid the woman's praises and addressing herself to the milkmaid who having finished her task now stepped over the stile which divided the field from the garden of the cottage with a pail of milk upon her head and advanced gracefully towards them in measured steps i am very happy to have pleased you sir replied the girl dropping her foot into the fourth position as she made an elegant curtsy and then glided gracefully on stay stay cried clara won't you give us another song before you go you must excuse me sir said the girl again gracefully curtsying i am exceedingly sorry to be obliged to refuse a gentleman of your appearance but singing requires an alternate enlargement and contraction of the glottis an elevation and depression of the larynx and an elongation and shortening of the neck very difficult to be performed with a pail of milk upon one's head set down the pail then said clara indeed i can't sir for i have not a moment to spare i just met some gentlemen of my acquaintance on the hill and i expect them here every moment i must snatch an instant or two to arrange my toilet gentlemen of your acquaintance cried the mother what gentleman can you have met with here child that know you my cousin john who went for a soldier some time since and a party of his companions and what brings them in these parts? No good, I fear, for John was always a wild good-for-nothing lad. It is no evil, I assure you, mother, said Angelica pertly, but you are always fancying the worst. 
john is become a man of consequence now and he is at the head of a party of soldiers searching for some state prisoners he'll be made a captain if he finds them and i hope he will with all my heart where are they now asked the mother in the wood replied the girl and my brother is gone to help them to search as he'll get a share of the reward if they find the fugitives whilst he is with them and you'd go too if you'd any wheat said the wife to her husband who had now seated himself comfortably before the fire and seemed very unwilling to be disturbed inspired however by his wife's remonstrance he roused himself and stretching his heavy limbs rolled rather than walked away angelica had also retired and clara was left alone with a woman it has already been mentioned that presence of mind was one of clara's distinguishing characteristics and perceiving the danger of the queen she was aware not a moment was to be lost the observations of the woman to her husband and in fact her whole manner showed that avarice was her master passion and upon this hint clara spoke she offered her abundance of gold she enlarged upon the greediness of the soldiers who if she waited for their approach would perhaps cheat her of her share in the promised reward or at least give her such a trifle as would not be worth having and at last drew forth the glittering metal and spread it before her eyes gold softens the hardest heart and the cottager's wife could resist no longer but promised to connive at their escape clara instantly ordered hans to prepare the horses and informing the prince and elvira of what had passed the whole party again set forward on their eventful journey End of chapter six part two of volume three volume three chapter seven part one of the mummy a tale of the twenty-second century this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the mummy a tale of the twenty-second century by jane loudon volume three chapter seven part one in the meantime roderick had been completely victorious in spain he had reached madrid and established don pedro as king and was now on his return to seville where he had left m de malet and his charming daughter edric of course accompanied him but the rest of the army had marched to cadiz to embark the greek page only attending upon his master well edric said the king laughing as they approached seville does not your heart beat with pleasure at the thought of quitting spain how can you torment me so roderick torment you why i thought you would be in raptures though i must own if you are they are the most melancholy raptures i ever beheld in my life this raillery is not generous it is unworthy of you i own i love mademoiselle de malet but i despair and why alas how can i ask her to share the fortunes of a banished man am not i your friend i know it but i cannot brook dependence even upon you i do not wish you to be dependent but what can i do to serve you shall i make war upon this cross old father of yours oh do not speak of him so lightly say what you please of me but spare my father i respect your feelings and as i can say no good of him i will have the discretion to be silent edric felt no inclination to reply to this remark and they travelled on in perfect silence till they reached seville here they found everything changed the town had been partially rebuilt and the lovely groves of orange and myrtle trees in the vicinity glowing with all the rich luxuriance of a southern spring gave no idea of the scene of ruin and desolation it had before presented they inquired for the house of m de malet and upon entering the inner square or courtyard they found him seated under the piazza that stretched round it enjoying the evening breeze whilst his fair daughter now perfectly recovered was occupied in reading to him a fountain played in the centre of the court its sparkling spray descending in silvery showers whilst innumerable orange trees and flowering shrubs which were placed around perfumed the air with their delicious fragrance and a light awning spread over the roof of the court 
mellowed the light to a soft though glowing tinge which gave an air of voluptuous languor to the whole scene the delight felt by m de Malet and his daughter at again seeing their deliverers was enthusiastic and though it was most openly expressed by the father the burning cheeks and sparkling eyes of pauline spoke quite as intelligibly her silent transport we have long expected you said m de Malet, for i cannot describe how anxious we are to leave this country pauline has wearied heaven with prayers for your safety and as i have felt my strength decay daily i too have prayed for your return for i have a secret to confide to you which weighs heavily upon my spirits to confide to us cried edric yes to you said m de Malet. it is true i have not known you long but some circumstances make men better acquainted in a month than the ordinary routine of life does in years thus the kindness with which you have treated me and the important events in which i have seen you engaged have made me consider you as old and tried friends and have induced me to confide to you a secret which i have hitherto guarded with the most scrupulous fidelity what can you mean asked edric in astonishment whilst pauline gazed upon her father with a look of the most intense anxiety pauline is not my child said the old man impressively pauline uttered a cry of agony that thrilled through the souls of her auditors and threw herself at his feet looking up in his face with an expression of the bitterest anguish as though she implored him not to desert her m de Malet's agitation was equal to her own and as he fondly regarded her he continued yes miserable being that i am i am not her father alas often when i have beheld her enduring hunger and thirst for my sake when i have seen her delicate frame exhausted with fatigue or shivering with cold whilst still with angelic sweetness she has seemed to forget her own sufferings and to think only of alleviating mine oh then how i have burnt to tell her that i did not deserve her kindness and that i was an alien from her blood oh father my dearest father cried pauline her eyes streaming with tears what do you not deserve from me what is there that i could do that could half express my love and gratitude alas though i am not your child the tender care you took of my infancy your kindness your affection pauline could not continue her sobs impeded her utterance my dear child said m de Malet, and folding her in his arms he mingled his tears with hers whilst roderick and edric were both too powerfully affected to interrupt their sorrows and stood gazing upon them in silence though both urgently desired an explanation of this seeming mystery after a short pause m de Malet resumed i see the astonishment i have caused you and my heart bleeds for the pain i have been compelled to inflict upon pauline but i could not die in peace without disclosing the truth oh do not talk of dying cried pauline still clinging to him with the fondest affection and who are the parents of mademoiselle de Malet? demanded roderick alas i know not returned the swiss about twenty years ago i was travelling in england with my wife who afflicted with an incurable disease had been advised to try the skill of english physicians they being considered the most able in the world one night my poor wife being exhausted with fatigue we stopped at a small inn in a village near the sea coast the night was tempestuous and a blazing light in the kitchen tempted us to wait there whilst the parlour was prepared for us a woman sat near the fire with a lovely little girl about two years old playing at her feet my poor wife was always passionately fond of children 
though heaven had never blessed us with any and attracted by the exquisite beauty of the little cherub she took it in her arms and began to caress it is your honour fond of children asked the woman with an evident affectation of vulgarity i dote upon them replied my wife oh louis continued she addressing me in french if i could leave such an angel as this to supply my place to you i think i could be resigned to die if your honour is like the child you may have her said the woman i started but recollecting that from the over-education of the lowest classes in england they were all linguists the circumstance of the woman understanding what we said did not appear extraordinary she is my child continued the woman i live hard by and have only taken shelter here from the storm the landlady knows me very well my husband has been dead some months and as i find it hard work to maintain myself and the child too i own i shall be glad to place her in hands where she is sure to be taken care of the woman's tale seemed plausible and my wife and i were easily induced to conclude the bargain which gave us possession of pauline we visited the cottage of this woman the next morning and found her story true excepting that she had only lived there a few weeks this however appeared immaterial as indeed she had not fixed any definite time for the period of her residence and gave some reason which i have forgotten for having left her former abode when her husband died soon after this we left england taking pauline with us her beauty increased with her years and when my poor wife died which she did a few months after our return to switzerland pauline formed the sole consolation of my life two or three years afterwards a friend of mine visiting england called by my desire upon the reputed mother of pauline he found the cottage deserted and the landlady of the inn told him that the woman had left the place a few hours after we had done so ourselves this circumstance combined with the evidently affected vulgarity of the woman and the elegance and delicacy of pauline has always induced me to suspect i was the dupe of a deception and that the child had been stolen from parents in a superior rank of life to that in which i found her whether my conjectures are correct i know not but when i have surveyed the beauty and graces of my child my breast has smote me for confining her to my own humble station and i have determined whenever circumstances would permit to take her to england and endeavour if possible to elucidate the mystery that hangs over her destiny accompany me then to ireland said roderick and when you have stayed there till you are tired if you still wish to prosecute your researches i will give you letters of introduction to the english court and i sincerely hope we may find our fair friend to be a princess of the blood at least in the meantime m de Molay's narrative had caused the greatest agitation in the breasts of edric and pauline not his daughter thought the former whose then can she be and his imagination ran wild amongst a variety of dreams and fancies each more extravagant than the last for to suppose the elegant and accomplished pauline the daughter of a mere peasant was impossible and the transporting hope that she might yet be his with the consent of his father and the approbation of all his friends danced before him whilst pauline uncertain what to think and unable to analyse her own sensations felt even amidst the desolation in which the avowal of m de Molay had involved her a faint emotion of pleasure still throbbed at her heart when she reflected that now her country was that of her lover and that it was possible she dared go no further for her senses seemed unable to support the intoxicating thoughts of what might follow it had been agreed that our friends should remain a few days at seville to give the army at cadiz time to recover from the fatigue of their march previous to their embarkation but the morning after their arrival a courier arrived with dispatches from england which made roderick impatient to leave spain immediately he was at breakfast when these letters which had been forwarded to him from cadiz were put into his hands he changed colour 
and starting from his seat begged edric to follow him into the garden good god what is the matter asked m de molet nothing nothing replied roderick but that i must return to ireland immediately and waving his hand as though to repel further inquiry he left the room edric followed in silence edric said the irish monarch throwing himself into a garden seat and burying his face in his hands elvira is dethroned and perhaps murdered all owing to my cursed folly in remaining so long in spain elvira exclaimed edric looking at his friend in the most profound amazement for he could not imagine why he took so deep an interest in her fate i see your astonishment edric resumed the king but i have not now time to explain why's and wherefores suffice it to say that i adore elvira and if she perish i will not survive her a piercing shriek burst from the thicket as he uttered these words and both edric and roderick sprang involuntarily to the spot it was vacant they searched the wood but no creature was to be seen it was fancy said edric it was the mummy murmured the king come to chide me for doubting his promises for an instant the mummy cried edric good god what do you mean and he gazed with horror upon the wild and haggard countenance of his friend who he seriously believed had become distracted his looks recalled the fleeting senses of roderick and with a ghastly smile he replied i am not mad though i have enough to make me so we must return to ireland without a moment's delay and there reinforce my army elvira must be restored immediately for her life is in danger from every moment's delay i hope not said edric for though i detest rosabella i do not think her capable of assassination if she be not father morris is returned roderick in a low voice with a look of intense feeling edric turned pale in the name of god tell me who and what you are said he earnestly and how you have obtained this close knowledge of the english court i am called the devil's favourite you know returned roderick smiling in spite of his distress at his friend's embarrassment and it would be very hard if my patron did not give me a hint now and then upon subjects of importance how can you jest upon such a topic asked edric reproachfully true returned roderick as you say the subject is not one to joke upon for we must quit seville in a few hours and leave m de molay and the pretty pauline to follow us under the escort of my greek page or rather what perhaps you would prefer you shall stay behind to take care of them and alexis and i will proceed alone oh roderick exclaimed edric how can you imagine i could leave you not even for pauline asked the king smiling not even for pauline repeated edric firmly my love for you surpasses even the devoted love of woman and whilst i breathe neither peril nor pleasure shall tear me from your side my dear edric said roderick the tears glistening in his eyes the next instant however he dashed them away and added gaily but come we must go and make our bows and take our leave like pretty behaved cavaliers and you may trust my discretion edric that i will not tell pauline of your want of gallantry the greek page looked the image of despair when he heard his master's commands that he should remain behind and passions dark as the lowering heavens before a storm hung upon his brow he offered no opposition however to his master's will and crossing his arms upon his breast bent his head in token of obedience the voyage of edric and roderick to ireland was rapid and favourable in the extreme and on their arrival their reception was enthusiastic the irish are proverbially warm-hearted and the rapture with which they now greeted their victorious monarch defies description triumphal arches were erected the walls were hung with tapestry and the streets strewed with flowers to greet his entry into his capital roderick did not refuse these honours but it was evident to all who knew him well that his mind was occupied with other things and in fact he took his measures so promptly and so decidedly that by the time his army with m de molay and his daughter 
Dr. Entwerfen and the Greek page, arrived from Spain, he had assembled a force quite sufficient for the restoration of the queen. The very day that Elvira fled in terror from the power of her rival, the combined army of Roderick began its march to hasten to her assistance and it had nearly advanced through the whole of the tunnel under the sea which separates the two kingdoms without opposition. Orders were now given for the soldiers to rest for the night, and tents were rapidly pitched for that purpose. Roderick, however, could not sleep, and he stood with his arms folded, gazing at the singular scene before him, the innumerable torches fixed against the dark sides of the tunnel, shedding their lurid light around, and showing distinctly the long line of white tents that stretched as far as the eye could reach, whilst the distant roaring of the sea above their heads sounded like the hoarse murmur of gathering thunder. Whilst Roderick was thus engaged, Edric perceived a group of people enter the cavern from the English side, and eagerly inquired for the king. They were brought before him. They were four in number, but one stayed behind, holding their horses, which looked dreadfully jaded and distressed, whilst the other three, a man and two women, approached and threw themselves at Roderick's feet. "'Good God! It is Elvira!' exclaimed he. "'Henry Seymour!' screamed the Queen, and fell senseless upon the ground. In the meantime all was anarchy in England. Disgusted with the world and with himself, the King secluded himself from society, and passed his time entirely upon a small estate adjoining the chateau of his father. Sir Ambrose and he often met, but they never spoke, though their hearts yearned towards each other. With all his good qualities, Sir Ambrose was prejudiced and obstinate. He loved his son passionately, but he could not endure a rebel, and the poor old man was fast sinking into the grave for want of the very consolation he would not condescend to receive. Edmund also was wretched. The habits of respect in which he had always been brought up towards his father prevented his daring to intrude upon him against his will, though he would willingly have relinquished his empty title of king and have exposed himself to all the miseries of absolute want to have obtained the privilege of throwing himself upon his father's neck and receiving his forgiveness. The title of Edmund was, indeed, now only an empty one. Rosabella alone exercised the power of a sovereign, and her haughty temper and capricious tyranny made her universally detested. Monarchs to be respected must be firm, and whilst they continue to inspire respect, they may sometimes venture to be tyrants. But Rosabella was no longer respected, she was despised, and the commons finding themselves oppressed, and their complaints completely unattended to, began to regret the gentle sway of Elvira. She, at least, said they, treated us with kindness, and if she did refuse our petitions, it was with gentleness. But now we are treated with scorn, and trampled beneath the feet, not only of the queen, but of her confessor. We will not, we cannot bear it. Sad and mournful also was the life of the Duke of Cornwall, for days and hours he would wander in the gardens of his chateau with his friend Sir Ambrose, and lament sorrowfully over the complete destruction of his hopes. In these walks they often saw Edmund gliding at a distance like a solitary ghost, and plunging amongst the trees when he thought himself observed. "'How changed Edmund is become,' said the Duke. "'Alas, how guilt corrodes the heart! He has destroyed my daughter, and is now suffering the penalty of his crime. Say not so, rejoined Sir Ambrose, who could not bear to hear his son blamed by anyone but himself. If Elvira had not eloped with Prince Ferdinand. Eloped with Prince Ferdinand, cried the Duke. I did not expect this. What, can you, Sir Ambrose, join in the general voice? Will you slander poor Elvira? Elvira, whom you have known from her cradle, whom you have loved and fondled as your own child. Patience, patience, my good friend. I have no patience. I can have no patience when I hear my daughter scandalized, my poor motherless girl. Remember, if she should err, she lost her mother in her childhood. She has been always brought up with me, 
and as she has been the playfellow of your sons from her earliest infancy perhaps she may not act according to those rigid restraints imposed upon her sex but those who have been secluded from the society of men but she means well sir ambrose she means well i am certain and i'd answer for her virtue with my life besides you know she has always been used to have an intimate friend of the other sex you know edmund no one blamed her whilst edmund was her friend and who dares blame her now no one i trust whilst i have an arm and a sword ready to defend her my good friend you reason like a fond father who though he sees is willing to excuse the faults of his offspring your judgment condemns elvira even more than mine no no if i thought her wrong i should blame her as you do your partiality to edmund blinds you and you fancy my poor child has a thousand faults because she was not sensible to the merit of your son you mistake me quiet my opinion of elvira would be just the same if edmund were not in existence though i acknowledge frankly that every time i see his fine noble countenance worn with care his pale cheeks and sunken eyes i feel a pang through my inmost soul it is a strange infatuation that she should repulse my noble boy and yet elope so readily with a youth she scarcely knew take care what you say sir ambrose take care what you say i will not have my child insulted i do not wish to insult her i speak but the truth i do not even think her guilty though the whole court rings with her shame guilt shame and this to me oh god oh god i have lived too long to hear my child thus basely slandered and be unable to resent it Bays, and is this the conclusion of your long friendship Bays, and have i lived to be called Bays for merely blaming a coquettish wanton wanton cried the duke and transported by his passion he struck sir ambrose violently the aged baronet could not endure this insult his sword flew from his cupboard and in a few seconds these ancient friends were engaged in mortal combat End of chapter 7, part 1 of volume 3volume three chapter seven part two of the mummy a tale of the twenty-second century this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the mummy a tale of the twenty-second century by jane loudon volume three chapter seven part two it was a shocking thing to see these two old men their white hair streaming in the wind their venerable features wrinkled with age and their feeble frames stuttering for support fighting with all the vindictive fury of youth how fearful is the storm of passion how vile the human heart when left to its own workings every gentle feeling was extinguished in the breasts of the two veterans and only brutal rage remained for some time victory was doubtful but at last sir ambrose fell and in another moment the sword of his antagonist would have passed through his bosom had not a powerful arm arrested the stroke it was edmund he had heard the clashing of swords at a distance and rushing to the spot arrived just in time to prevent the fatal blow oh my father cried edmund with a thrill of horror for god's sake do not die till you have forgiven me he hears me not cried he wringing his hands in unutterable anguish oh for mercy's sake speak do not destroy me sir ambrose feebly opened his languid eyes farewell said he faintly god bless you oh do you forgive me shrieked edmund falling upon his knees i do said sir ambrose and the duke the words feebly ebbed from his lips and as he spoke the fearful rattle of death gurgled in his throat 
and with a convulsive sob he expired sadly did the duke now gaze upon his fallen foe but when he found him dead he was distracted madly he tore his hair and threw himself upon the corpse but his agonies were in vain the vital spark was extinct edmund stood also for some seconds gazing upon the body without any distinct idea existing in his mind but when the whole sad reality rushed upon him he could not endure his own thoughts and darted away with the velocity of lightning the duke heeded not his departure he had thrown himself upon the body of his departed friend and the whole universe seemed to contain for him only that bloody corpse i have killed him i have killed him cried he i have killed him his fearful shrieks soon drew many persons to the spot i have killed him screamed the duke in answer to all interrogations i have killed him Ablard was one of the first collected round this mournful spectacle. "'What can we do?' said he to Father Murphy. "'The case seems desperate.' "'I have killed him,' again screamed the Duke in agony. "'He's entirely mad,' said Father Murphy, "'and there's no doubt of it.' "'I've killed him,' repeated the Duke, with a still more piercing shriek. "'I've killed him.' oh he is mad cried all the spectators whilst they attempted to remove him from the spot with infinite difficulty they succeeded he is still clinging to the corpse and screaming i've killed him till his voice was lost in the distance whilst these scenes were transacting at the english court the army of roderick marched through the kingdom without opposition for the people everywhere tired of the tyranny of her rival received elvira with open arms and the chief nobility vied with each other in opening their houses to entertain her and her suite as she passed along it was a fine evening in march and the night was clear though cold when elvira with hurried steps paced the fine terrace belonging to the castle of one of these noblemen the queen was evidently lost in reflection and as she occasionally stopped she threw back her long hair and looked up to the sky with an air of intense anxiety it is a lovely night murmured she heaven grant that peace may still attend us yet i fear i know not what of danger oh if the forces of rosabella should resist and roderick should fall and for me she paused for the thought seemed too dreadful for endurance the moon shone brightly in the heavens and the stars sparkled like diamonds on the clear blue sky while stelvira raising her eyes to heaven and clasping her hands together seemed lost in silent prayer her fair face shaded by her long black veil looked even more lovely than usual from the soft light thrown upon it and as she stood thus apparently quite absorbed in inward devotion she seemed almost a celestial being descended for the moment upon earth and about to remount to her native skies a figure wrapped in a long dark cloak now appeared at the extremity of the terrace and advanced slowly towards the queen two other figures also emerged from the shade and followed though at a considerable distance elvira was not aware of their approach till the first figure stood behind her and seizing her arms threw a cloak over her head to stifle her cries and then with the help of the others was hurrying her off at this moment roderick sprang actively upon the terrace and with one blow from his vigorous arm felt the first assailant to the ground then drawing his sword the enraged monarch would have instantly dispatched him had not the supposed assassin uttered a piercing scream and clinging round his knees implored mercy the moon shone full upon the boy's face and disclosed to roderick's astonished eyes the features of the dumb page alexis cried he the boy sprang from the ground roderick screamed he then i am ruined stay returned the king grasping his arm and preventing his escape who and what are you speak or dread my vengeance the boy's heart beat almost to suffocation 
every nerve throbbed with the most violent emotion and drawing a dagger from his belt he attempted to plunge it into the heart of roderick oh cried the king starting aside in time to prevent the blow whilst ere he could prevent it the page had buried the weapon in his own bosom good god exclaimed roderick what can this mean the whole of this scene had passed with such rapidity that elvira had scarcely time to recover herself or to be aware of what had happened the two assistants had fled the moment they perceived the king and elvira with trembling steps and pallid cheeks approached the spot where roderick knelt beside the bleeding page throwing herself beside him she attempted to staunch the blood which flowed rapidly from the wound but in vain for the boy's life was evidently fast ebbing brian a servant of the king who had followed his master to the terrace aided her endeavours but roderick remained fixed and immovable his eyes chained as by the power of fascination upon the page who now slowly unclosed his eyelids and heaving a deep sigh fixed his languid eyes upon those of roderick zoe cried the king yes returned the page gasping for breath and speaking with difficulty zoe i am indeed that wretch i loved you roderick i would have died for you i do die for you but but elvira what meant your outrage upon her what did it mean cried zoe her eyes flashing fire and her whole frame supported by a supernatural energy did i not see that you loved her and could i endure to resign you to another no continued she starting from the ground i would have killed her and had she perished i should have died contented the violence of the action made the blood gush in torrents from her wound and pale and feeble her failing eyes closed she staggered a few paces fell heaved one convulsive struggle and zoe was no more sadly did roderick gaze upon that form which had so lately thrilled with feeling now cold and inanimate at his feet the victim of passion lay before him her hopes her fears her rage and her love had passed away and there her body remained a senseless clod of clay till it should be resolved into its original elements by this time some of the servants of the castle who had been summoned by brian approached and the old heir of warwick in whose castle the fatal scene had taken place rushed upon the terrace calling wildly upon his people to save the queen is it the lady elvira that you mean asked brian oh ain't it please your honour and she's safe every inch of her and what has been the matter asked the earl oh and your lordship may well ask that but the devil a bit anybody can tell you but one and that's myself you see my master his most gracious majesty and me were walking in the garden that is he was walking and i was watching for fear any harm should happen to him for the life of such as he isn't to be trusted to chance in a strange country and i guess he was thinking of the queen though he never said nothing about it and so when we came near the terrace it was so dark you couldn't see your hand before you and then the moon peeped through the clouds like a pretty face looking through a ground glass window and then she came out as bright as a silver mirror and the queen looked so pretty as she stood praying that my master couldn't find it in his heart to interrupt her and for me i wasn't the man to be even thinking of such a thing and then two black-looking spalpeens bad luck to them stole out behind her and there wasn't two for there were three of them with never a living soul beside to be seen in respect of being near her but god never would suffer a real lady like herself to want a friend to comfort her when she'd be in need and my master wouldn't let her be after coming to harm for he jumped upon the terrace entirely like a hound springing at the deer and saved her which nobody but himself could have done like it for the very life of him and when i came there was the man lying dead that would have killed the princess and it turned out he wasn't a man at all but a woman the story of zoe is soon told bred in a warm climate and naturally enthusiastic in her disposition she was a child of passion the misfortune she had experienced in greece by depriving her of all she loved had thrown back her affections upon her own bosom and they had preyed upon themselves 
to give vent to the feelings that oppressed her she created an image of perfection in her own mind and this she worshipped in secret when she saw roderick all was changed a new world seemed to open upon her the idol of her fancy stood before her for roderick realized all her wildest dreams he became her god his heroism his person his talents caught her imagination and the violence of her passions completed the delirium of her soul notwithstanding however the intensity of her feelings no thought of grosser texture contaminated her mind her love was as that of angels pure and undefiled she regarded roderick as a thing enshrined almost too holy for mortal vows to worship and she would have considered it sacrilege to dare even to think of him as a husband with these feelings she had watched over him with almost a mother's love and when she informed him of the conspiracy against him she resolved with all the romantic self-devotion of a fond woman to follow him unknown and in disguise without any plan however but that of being near him or any hope but that of contributing to his happiness money and the assistance of one or two devoted servants who contrived to follow in roderick's train had enabled her to accomplish this she had felt a momentary jealousy at his anxiety for pauline but that feeling had worn away when she discovered the mutual passion of edric and the fair swiss now the case was different and maddened by the sight of roderick's devotion to elvira she had determined to destroy her her trusty greeks would have assisted her plan but they fled at her detection inexpressibly shocked at what had taken place roderick could scarcely bear again to separate himself even for an instant from elvira do not bid me leave you said he looking at her with the fondest affection you shall accompany me even to the field oh would to heaven you would give me a right to be near you for ever alas alas replied elvira i tremble for the result of this fatal contest oh that i were but a humble peasant would to heaven you were cried roderick with enthusiasm for happy as i always am in your presence never do i feel so much so as when we seem as at present secluded from the world then i could forget your rank and all the artificial restraints grandeur has thrown around you and without remembering that i am roderick and you elvira think only of a pair of simple lovers whose weightiest care was their attendance upon their flocks and whose only happiness consisted in loving and being beloved alas roderick replied elvira do not speak of love after the dreadful scene we have just witnessed i tremble at the passion no be my friend roderick friendship is more sure than love on that we may confidently rely but passion destroys itself with what it feeds upon intense feelings cannot last oh elvira say not so cried roderick fixing his eyes earnestly upon her blushing countenance whilst she trembling and agitated betrayed by her confusion the passion she would have fain concealed how feeble are words to express the transports of such a moment tis the oasis in the desert of life the bright gem that casts a radiance even upon the draws with which it is surrounded man is born to misery thick clouds hang over him and obscure his path dangers await him at every step one single ray alone breaks through the gloom bright as the fairy dreams of childhood but alas equally fleeting tis love pure passionate unsophisticated love the only glimpse of heaven vouchsafed on earth to man and this was what was now felt by roderick and elvira as he throwing himself at her feet vowed eternal constancy and persuaded her to acknowledge that her hopes of earthly happiness centred in him alone but why do i profane such a scene by attempting to describe it those who have loved have only to recollect what they felt upon a similar occasion and to those who have not heaven help them not all the eloquence of cicero would give the least idea of anything of the kind suffice it to say that before roderick and elvira parted she consented if success should crown their efforts to become his bride the state of england at this moment defies description the death of sir ambrose and the insanity of the duke of cornwall were events so shocking in themselves 
that it was not surprising they produced a violent effect upon the minds of the people edmund had disappeared and rosabella instigated by father morris and marian became every day more rapacious and tyrannical whilst even they quarrelled among themselves and wretchedness prevailed throughout the kingdom this was the state of the public mind when the news of the invasion of roderick first reached the ears of rosabella marian she exclaimed summon father morris we are ruined continued she as the reverend father entered absolutely ruined roderick is invincible and he supports elvira where is Caops? hey returned father morris where is Caops? it is that accursed fiend that has led us on to destruction his counsels have destroyed us for though plausible in appearance they have been as deceitful as the oracles of old yet you trusted him said rosabella i hated him from the first but you trusted him you thought him of perfection he flattered your vanity and you weakly believed everything he asserted weakly cried father morris his lips quivering with rage yes weakly returned rosabella for a child would have seen through his artifices but you were deceived by them and have been his dupe his tool his plaything this to me cried father morris gnashing his teeth together with passion yes to you returned rosabella coolly for why should i longer conceal my sentiments i will no longer be your slave you have made me deserted by my husband hated by my subjects and detested by myself i will therefore no longer follow your counsels from henceforward i will act for myself adieu we meet no more as friends and as she spoke she walked out of the room leaving the priest motionless with astonishment this to me cried he to marian as soon as he recovered himself sufficiently to speak to me who have sacrificed everything for her did i not place her on the throne have i scrupled even to imbrue my hands in blood for her sake have i not committed crimes for her that weigh heavily upon my soul did i not poison claudia and should i not also have destroyed elvira if Caops had not saved her oh marian am i awake is it not a cruel dream is it possible it can be rosabella rosabella my rosabella my child my own rosabella that uses me thus hush hush cried marian tis but the passion of a moment be composed rosabella still loves you but irritated by the desertion of edmund and the news she has just heard oh marian interrupted the friar in agony you may easily reason but you never had a child but if heaven had blessed us with one you might have felt for my anguish i do feel for you returned marian but does she not treat me with equal scorn since the absence of edmund she has become distracted and i who know the agonies a woman endures when she finds herself deserted by the man she adores can feel for her and who first gained her edmund would he ever have become her husband had not i induced him i believe not neither would she have been queen but for you no no oh how i have toiled for that ungrateful girl how i have adored her you have been a devoted father have i not marian i have at least endeavoured to expiate my sin i have done penance i have spent nights unnumbered in painful vigils i have scorched my body till the feeble flesh has sunk beneath the torture yet still my mind remains unappeased remorse still gnaws my vitals o oh, marian how poor is earthly grandeur to a mind diseased in this manner did these companions in iniquity confer till at length hating each other and themselves they gave vent to mutual upbraiding and parted with undisguised hatred and contempt such indeed is the disgusting nature of sin that though a man may shut his eyes to his own defects 
or rather see them through the magic prism of self-love, yet he almost always abhors them when he sees them reflected in another. Thus it was with Father Morris. Marian had been his associate in many scenes of vice. He had in fact first led her from the paths of virtue, and, as is usual in such cases, he now hated the creature he had made. Father Morris was indeed that brother of the Duke of Cornwall, whose crimes and punishment have been before slightly hinted at. He had married in early life a beautiful and accomplished woman, but instigated by the machinations of Marian, who he had previously seduced and abandoned, he had become jealous of her, and, in a paroxysm of rage, had deprived her of life. This was the crime he had since endeavoured to expiate by the penance of his whole life. Vain, however, had been his endeavour. The mortification of the body avails little, where the humiliation of the spirit is wanting. And Father Morris, notwithstanding his apparent repentance, was proud, envious, and intolerant. In a fit of remorse, after the death of his wife, he had embraced a monastic life, and in order to subject himself to a perpetual penance, had placed himself as father confessor to his brother. No situation, in fact, could have been more painful to a proud spirit than this. Yet this daily misery Father Morris felt a pride in supporting without murmuring. It is strange, but true, that haughty spirits sometimes feel almost pleasure in trying their powers of endurance to the utmost. For there is a self-satisfaction in thinking we have borne what seems almost too much for mortals, that often consoles a man under the acutest agonies. This was the case with Father Morris, and the daily tortures which he endured without shrinking almost reconciled him to himself. Ambition, however, was still his master passion, and as his monastic vows prevented its indulgence in his own person, he devoted himself to the advancement of his child. How he succeeded, and how he was rewarded, has been already shown. End of chapter 7, part 2 of volume 3 Volume 3, Chapter 8 of The Mummy, A Tale of the Twenty-Second Century. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Mummy, A Tale of the Twenty-Second Century by Jane Loudon. Volume 3, Chapter 8. Have you heard the news? asked Lord Maysworth one morning, bustling into the breakfast-room of Lord Gustavus de Montfort. "'What is it?' demanded the noble lord, who was sitting at breakfast with his usual satellites. "'The King of Ireland has arrived at Oxford with an immense army, intending to re-establish Elvira.' "'Impossible!' cried Lord Gustavus. "'Impossible!' echoed the satellites. "'Something must be done,' said Lord Maysworth. Thinking as I think, and as I am confident every one who hears me must think, or at least ought to think, said Lord Gustavus, no government can be worse than the one we have at present. The Queen has not performed one of her promises, subjoined Dr. Hartman, and her caprice and cruelty are beyond endurance. Her extravagance is unbounded, said Lord Maysworth. And her arrogance extreme, rejoined Lord Gustavus. The satellites shook their heads in chorus. In my opinion, said Lord Maysworth, we had better seek Elvira and try to propitiate her. She was used to be mild and gentle. But will she not be too much exasperated with our former desertion to listen to us? asked Dr. Hardman. I think not, said Lord Gustavus pompously. The result of this conference may be easily imagined. Rosabella found herself deserted. Many who would not have had courage to abandon her cause, had they not found precedence for their conduct, fled in the suite of the rebel lords. Roderick rapidly advanced, and his army was every day augmented by the discontented English. "'I am lost, Marian,' cried the Queen when she found the enemy was within a day's march of her capital. "'I am ruined past redemption.' "'Do not desert yourself,' said Marian, "'and you may yet be saved. If you despair—' It is a virtual acknowledgment of the weakness of your cause. What will become of me? continued Rosabella, wringing her hands. No earthly help can save me. But courage may, said the deep voice of Caeops, who had entered the room unobserved. Ah! screamed Rosabella. 
It is the fiend. Chaops laughed, and the unearthly sound rang hoarsely in the ears of his auditors. Speak, demon, or whatever thou art, cried Marion. Shall we perish? You shall meet with your reward, said the mummy calmly. Are you satisfied? Oh, Rosabella, screamed Father Morris, rushing into the room in an agony of despair. Save her! Save my child! Your child? cried Rosabella. Can it be possible that you are my father? I am. I am, but fly, fly, and I forgive everything. Only let us fly. Alas, cried Marion, he has but too much reason for his agony. The enemy have entered the city. What will become of us? ejaculated the friar. Fiend, monster, barbarian, cried he, addressing Cheops and seizing him roughly by the arm. Deliver us. It was thy accursed counsels which involved us in ruin. Save us. My counsels that led ye to ruin? returned Chaops with one of his bitter laughs. Say rather your own passions. Did I urge you to murder Claudia? Nay, did I not save Elvira? Did I not warn you that the throne and misery were inseparably connected? And have not all my promises been fulfilled to the very letter? Yes, yes, to the letter, returned Father Morris, but not in spirit. By the sacred hawks of Osiris, kept at Edford, I swore Rosabella should be queen, and you her favorite minister. Talk not of what is past, cried the priest impatiently. Tell me how to act. The foe is at the gates of the palace. Did you not say there was a secret passage leading from this chamber? There is, there is, cried Father Morris with rapture. We will there lie concealed, and may surprise them. Chaops laughed. Am I still your foe? asked he with his usual bitterness. Name it not, name it not, cried Father Morris. We have not an instant to lose. Hurry into the subterranean passage. I hear the horses of the enemy in the court of the palace. Thebes was perforated with passages, yet she has fallen, muttered Chaops as he followed the friar and Rosabella through the opening into the secret chamber. Marion joined them, and the spring panel closed. Nothing could be more flattering than the reception Elvira met with from the people. Roderick had placed her at the head of his army, and the people hailed her appearance with rapture. Not a blow had been struck, for the army of Rosabella had joined her banners, and Elvira advanced to London without opposition. Too mild and forgiving to indulge a single feeling of revenge, she felt rejoiced that her rival had escaped, and wished no pursuit to be instituted. Edric, however, was not so quiescent. A thousand circumstances flashed upon his mind, to prove that the accession of Rosabella had been long planned by Father Morris, and he felt convinced he had been the dupe of the plans they had laid to induce him to quit the kingdom. "'I will find him,' said he, "'and expose his infamy. He shall not escape me thus.' Vain, however, was his search, and he returned to the room so lately occupied by Rosabella, restless and dispirited. Elvira was now in this splendid chamber, surrounded by her friends, and trembling with agitation, was awaiting the expected arrival of her father. "'Oh, heavens!' exclaimed she, as the poor old man was led in. "'Roderick, my beloved Roderick, can we not save him?' "'Alas!' returned Roderick. "'I fear—' But compose yourself, my dearest girl. All may yet go well. Where is Elvira? My child, my darling Elvira, cried the old man. I did not kill her, no, whispered he, drawing near to Roderick. I killed him, it is true, but it was for her sake. He slandered my child, and I could not bear that. Oh, God, oh, God, cried Elvira. Have mercy upon him. It breaks my heart to see him thus. Leave us, I implore you, she continued, addressing her friends. I cannot bear that even you should see the extent of his malady. Leave him with me, and perhaps my presence may recall his lost recollection. 
Finding opposition only increase her anxiety, her friends at length consented, and Elvira was left alone with her father. Kneeling by his side, as he lay stretched upon a sofa, the queen endeavoured to console him, but he knew her not, and wrung her heart by calling vehemently upon Elvira. "'If I could see my child,' said he, "'I should die contented. Call my child. Where is Elvira? Yes, yes, I know she is a queen and cannot come to me. Yet I think even a queen might look at her poor old father. I only want her to look at me.' Whilst this scene was passing, Rosabella and her friends lay concealed in the secret chamber, and, through the immovable panel, watched everything that passed. "'Now is the time,' cried Father Morris, when he saw that Elvira, exhausted by her grief, had hidden her face in her hands, to indulge her tears unrestrainedly. "'You ensure your own destruction if you attempt to kill her?' said Cheops. "'I care not,' returned Father Morris and removing the panel he approached. Elvira saw him not, and the shining dagger already was aimed at her breast when it caught the eye of the maniac, and returning reason flashed through his mind. "'Edgar!' cried he with a piercing scream. "'Spare my child!' The cry roused the friends of Elvira, who had remained in the antechamber, and they rushed in. In an instant the room was crowded. Father Morris was secured, and his confederates, from his having left the panel open, discovered. Edgar, cried the duke, yes, it is Edgar, my brother, my only brother, and this is Elvira. She is not fled. I knew she was not. She is safe. And is it possible, cried Edric, that you can be Duke Edgar? I am that wretch, said Father Morris. Then Rosabella is my child and for her I have become the wretch I am. Yet to her I have done my duty, and if she be spared... Ah! cried Monsieur de Mallet. It is... it is... Yes, I am not deceived. That is the woman who sold us Pauline. Who? Which? exclaimed Edric eagerly. There! cried the Swiss, pointing to Marion. Marion? exclaimed Edric. Yes, said she. Marion! He is right. It was I, and now is the moment of my vengeance. Seduced and deserted by this man, pointing to Father Morris, my passions always impetuous, panted for revenge. I instigated him to murder the wife for whom he had abandoned me. I stole his child and sold her to a stranger, and I substituted my own wretched offspring, whom I had had by a man he abhorred, in its place. What? cried Father Morris, his livid lips quivering with anguish. Is not Rosabella my child? No, said Marion. Twenty years ago I sold your child to this gentleman, pointing to Monsieur de Mallet. He was a foreigner, and I believed, by placing her in his hands, you would never see her more. Then who is Rosabella? My child, and by your servant Jacques. Curse is on thee, woman. What? Have I then destroyed myself here and hereafter for the offspring of that wretch? A man I detested, abhorred, despised. Yes, said Marion with a fiendish laugh. You abandoned me, and I swore to be revenged. He heard my oath, and by promising to assist me, obtained my consent to be his paramour. By his aid, I effected all the rest. He has long been dead, but still I have pursued my plan, and when I saw you risking soul and body for Rosabella, I have gloried, for I was revenged. Fiend! cried the priest, and rushing upon her before anyone could prevent him, he stopped her to the heart, and then instantly, withdrawing the dagger, buried it in his own bosom. Still I am revenged cried Marion, as heaving a deep sigh, she expired. Father Morris never spoke again. My tale is nearly closed, for dull must be the mind that cannot picture all the rest. The duke recovered his reason, and enjoyed all the happiness his bosom was yet capable of, in witnessing the union of his daughter and Roderick, whom he had loved as Henry Seymour, and now adored as the hero of Ireland. 
he gave pauline a noble fortune as his niece and she married edric who in the absence of his brother took possession of his father's wealth and fixed his residence in his former dwelling where after all his troubles dr Entwerfen found himself comfortably re-established in his ancient chamber whilst clara by becoming the bride of prince ferdinand secured her own happiness the coronation of roderick and elvira as king and queen of the united kingdom of great britain and ireland was superb and far excelled that in which elvira had previously been an actress taught wisdom by experience however she no longer placed implicit reliance upon the shouts of applause which followed her footsteps yet even with the reflection that all the promises she received might be evanescent she could not resist the emotion of pleasure that swelled her breast when after the priest had pronounced the nuptial benediction she walked with roderick the chosen of her heart through a long line of kneeling subjects and heard every mouth implore blessings on their heads and bestow praises on her choice proudly did elvira look around as she reached the entrance of westminster hall yet ere she entered it a rush and bustle in the crowd attracted her attention and a man clad like a monk threw himself before her elvira screamed when the man throwing back his cowl fixed his heavy eyes upon her and exclaimed do you not know me elvira it was edmund alas alas cried he the demon was right i trusted in my own strength and i have fallen miserably fallen though i knew it not ambition was my god and everything else weighed lightly in the scale yet even when my ambition was gratified i was wretched for i loved you elvira even whilst i plotted against you and as my own heart reproached me i felt every wrong you suffered far more poignantly than you could yourself my poor father too but all is over now and i am doomed to bitter expiation of my sins bitter indeed for oh how far beyond all other sufferings are the never-dying tortures of remorse one thought alone haunted my mind one image alone floated before my senses i could not die till i had obtained your pardon pardon me then elvira see thus humbly at thy feet i implore thy forgiveness crouching in the dust and bending my neck to be thy footstool rise i entreat you rise said elvira and be assured i forgive you nay that i pity you from my inmost soul she pities me cried edmund yet i can bear even this even pity and am i indeed fallen so low as to be pitied yes yes i am indeed to be pitied i did not mean to wound your feelings returned elvira believe me edmund tell me what is there i can do for you nothing cried he wildly the world is nothing for me now pity that unhappy woman who was my wife and as for me forget me never said elvira for never can i forget your disinterested love and your devoted affection their heart however is capricious and mine though sensible to your merits was destined for another and well does that other deserve your love for even jealousy itself must own that roderick is worthy to be your husband yes to him i can resign you farewell elvira you shall never see me more let my brother take my inheritance may you be happy god bless you god bless you and starting from his knees he disappeared before she could reply the spirits of elvira were agitated by this event which threw a damp over the remaining festivities of the day and trembling and unnerved she proceeded to the magnificent hall where a sumptuous banquet was prepared for her reception for some days after this event the attention of roderick and elvira was occupied in arranging the different affairs of the kingdom whilst edric and pauline with the old duke of cornwall monsieur de molay and father murphy retired to the house of the former in the country where dr Entwerfen was already comfortably established a thousand emotions swelled in the heart of edric as he approached this venerable mansion and saw again its well-known turrets peeping through the trees strange indeed are the feelings that oppress the mind when the wanderer returns after a long absence to the habitation of his forefathers 
a mingled crowd of contradictory sensations of disappointed hopes of undefined fears flowed through his fancy and as well-remembered objects recall the visions which formerly delighted him he starts at the difference the experience of their fallacy has made in himself and he sighs in vain for a return of the blissful ignorance he formerly despised all too appears changed as the human mind judges only by comparison the eyes become dazzled by distant splendours and that which to the eyes of youth had appeared superb seems to the mature judgment of manhood tame vapid and insipid whilst the imagination which had fondly cherished the favourite dreams of childhood and decked them in all the vivid colours of fancy feels disappointed and disgusted though its curse knows why to find the reality so different from the image it had pictured to itself such were the feelings of edric as he entered the grand hall of this residence of his ancestors and gazed upon the well-remembered faces of the crowd of servants assembled to meet him at the head of these was davies his tall thin figure waving to and fro and his long white hair floating upon his shoulders and the more spruce and gallant aspects of Ablod and his devoted eloise the late mrs russell who had blessed him with the possession of her fair hand a few days before and now stood blushing and simpering with all the affected modesty of a bride of sixty to receive the congratulations of those around her welcome welcome my dear edric cried dr Antwerfen, rushing downstairs to meet them his sleeves tucked up and his wig thrown back in a very experimental philosophic manner rejoice with me too for i have recovered my balloon my darling caoutchouc bottle of inflammability my immortalizing snuff and more than all my adored galvanic battery yes my compendium of science my epitome of talent and my most inestimable treasure is safe not indeed that which was employed in galvanizing the mummy but its counterpart its duplicate its prototype the mummy came to england and the balloon being recognized to be mine it was placed in my apartment where it has remained ever since stowed up in safe but inglorious obscurity till my return oh and that's a clear case said father murphy and there is no doubt of it leaving the delighted doctor to show the treasures of his laboratory to m de Mallet, edric retired to his chamber and after surveying again and again the well-known objects it contained he hurried to his favourite grove it is singular how inanimate objects which have been long unseen recall the thoughts and train of feelings indulged in when one last beheld them thus the house the groves the walks the gardens and the river recalled all its former longings to edric's mind and he again burned to converse with the disembodied spirit as he entered the grove where he had formerly so often ruminated and indulged dreams wild and improbable as the delusions of delirium the day was beautiful it was one of those bright glowing mornings in april when few drops hang upon every thorn when the sun shines brightly through the clear pure air and all nature seems awaking to new life and vigour from repose edric entered the grove and threw himself upon that very bank where he had reclined only a few months before under such different feelings the river the grove the bank were all the same he only was changed and yet said he is not my mind still as unsettled as before am i not still wandering in a labyrinth of doubts unknowing where to turn and yet tormented with a restless desire to discover my way what can have become of the mummy i so strangely resuscitated it is strange that since the restoration of elvira it seems to have vanished and yet all here speak of it as of a living animated being would that i could see it o oh, chaops chaops suddenly a strange unearthly voice seemed to murmur harshly in his ear go to the pyramid there and there only can thy hopes be gratified edric started upon his feet no one was near him and not a sound broke the awful stillness which reigned around save the gentle rippling of the river that flowed at his feet he gazed wildly on every side hoping yet fearing 
to behold the ghastly being he fancied his words had conjured up. It was in vain. No dark figure interposed between him and the clear bright sunshine. No gloomy shadow stretched along the plain. All looked gay as youth and happiness. Yet still that awful voice rang in his ears and thrilled through every nerve. I will go to the pyramid, cried he energetically. I will again enter that horrid tomb, but I will go alone. In pursuance of this sudden but irresistible desire, Edric hastily prepared to return to Egypt, and feigning that he was called to London by business of importance to satisfy the anxious curiosity of Pauline, he departed. Indescribable emotions throbbed in his bosom as he took his seat in the stage balloon which was to convey him to Egypt. But when he saw the towers and temples, and above all the pyramids of this mysterious country, lying beneath his feet, his agitation increased almost to agony. It was with infinite difficulty that he obtained permission again to visit the objects of his journey, as, since the mysterious disappearance of the mummy, the tomb of Cheops had been closed from mortal eyes. The interference of the British consul, however, at length obviated all objections, and Edric, whose impatience had become absolute torture from the delay, once more entered that awful receptacle of fallen greatness. Scarcely a twelfth month had elapsed since he had last trod it those solemn vaults. Yet what a change had taken place in his destiny! When he considered the number and variety of the events which had befallen him, he could scarcely fancy it possible that they had been crowded into so short a space of time, and, instead of a year, centuries seemed to have rolled over his head. His feeling of personal identity seemed confused, his senses became bewildered, and he mechanically followed his conductor almost without knowing whither he was going. At last the guide stopped. This is the tomb of Cheops, said he. I suppose, sir, you will enter it alone? Edric started. The words of the guide seemed to ring in his ears as the knell of death, and he shuddered as the thought crossed his mind that some horrid and appalling punishment might even now await him for his presumption. Desperately he snatched the torch from the hands of his guide and advanced alone. Darkly did those gloomy vaults seem to frown at his approach, and fearfully did his footsteps resound as he slowly penetrated into their deep recesses. At length he reached the tomb, but the brazen gates were closed, and he attempted in vain to open them. He placed the torch upon the ground, and again tried to unclose the fatal portal. He exerted his whole strength, but still it resisted his efforts. Rendered desperate, he now threw himself against the gates with almost superhuman force, Suddenly a hollow sound murmured through the cavern, and the current of wind rushed by with mighty and resistless fury. The brazen gates flew open with a fearful clang, and the torch fell and was extinguished. The next moment the sepulchral lamp shot forth a faint gleaming light, which brightened by degrees into a steady flame, whilst heavenly music sounded faintly upon the ear, dying gradually away in murmurs, soft as those of the aeolian harp the brilliant light of the lamp now glowed with noonday radiance and showed distinctly every corner of the fatal chamber edric looked timidly around and shuddered as each well-remembered object met his eyes but what was his horror and surprise when glancing at the marble sarcophagus of cheops he beheld the gigantic figure of the mummy standing erect beside it it was again simply wrapped in the garments of the tomb, and its glassy eyes, rigid features, and statue-like form chilled Edric to the heart. He looked at it a few moments in silence, till it raised its arm and seemed about to address him, when, shrinking back with indescribable horror, he uttered a faint shriek and hid his face in his hands. "'Why dost thou tremble?' asked the mummy, in a deep, hollow voice, which thrilled through Edric's very soul. Didst thou not come here to seek me, and dost thou shudder to behold my form? I am now before thee. Ask what thou wilt. I am permitted to reply. Why art thou silent? Why does thy heart seem to wither in my presence? 
alas alas is no mortal to be found free from the debasing influence of fear thou art called bold courageous and noble thou hast dared to soar above thy fellow-men and thou hast ardently wished to see me behold i am here and now weak fearful and inconsistent as thou art thou shunnest my approach i do not shun thee said edric removing his hands and endeavouring to look calmly on the fearful being before him though the flesh seemed to quiver on his bones with the effort i do not shun thee but the nerves will shrink though the mind be firm i did wish to see thee for ardently do i still desire to know the secrets of the tomb cheops burst into one of his fearful laughs weak silly worm are you not satisfied then how would this knowledge avail you has anything but misery attended your former researches and can anything but misery attend the knowledge you now covet learn wisdom by experience seek not to pry into secrets denied to man if you wish still however to be resolved of your doubts behold me ready to satisfy them but i warn you wretchedness will await upon my words then i will no longer seek to hear them for even weak as you esteem me i can learn wisdom from experience thus then i tear the tormenting doubts which so long have haunted me from my mind and bid them farewell for ever it is well said cheops his eyes beaming with joy then my task is accomplished i have at last found a reasonable man i honour you for you can command yourself and now you may command me i wish it not said edric have you no curiosity asked the mummy with a ghastly smile none returned edric unless it be that i would fain know your history and the meaning of the sculptures upon your tomb what are they demanded cheops a youthful warrior is bearing off a beautiful woman in his arms whilst an old man laments bitterly in the distance i was the warrior said cheops and the beautiful female was arsinoe i loved her and to gratify my impetuous passion i tore her from the arms of her father by force the warrior is afterwards contending with the old man who falls beneath his blows he did he did cried cheops he died by my hand and eternal misery haunts me for the deed and this old man was my father cried the mummy wreathing in agony and arsinoe was my sister my own beloved sister a solemn pause followed this speech for edric was too much shocked to speak again to the awful being who had avowed such crimes and upon whose face were traced passions too horrible to be imagined after a short silence cheops again exclaimed yes yes i see your horror and it is just but think you that i do not suffer know that the fiend a wild never dying fiend rages here continued he pressing his hand upon his breast it gnaws my vitals it burns with unquenchable fire and never ceasing torment permitted for a time to revisit earth i have made use of the powers entrusted to me to assist the good and punish the malevolent under pretence of aiding them i gave them counsels which only plunged them yet deeper in destruction whilst the evil that my advice appeared to bring upon the good was only like a passing cloud before the sun it gave lustre to the success that followed my task is now finished be happy edric for happiness is in your power be wise for wisdom may be obtained by reflection and be merciful for unless we give how can we expect mercy rely not on your own strength seek not to pry into mysteries designed to be concealed from man and enjoy the comforts within your reach for know that knowledge above the sphere of man's capacity produces only wretchedness and that to be contented with our station and to make ourselves useful to our fellow-creatures is the only true path to happiness the mummy ceased to speak 
and his features, which had appeared wild and animated during his conversation with Edric, became fixed. The unearthly lustre that had flashed from his eyes faded away and gave place to a glassy deadness. His limbs became rigid, and as the light of the lamp gradually sank to less distinctness, the ghastly form of the mummy seemed rapidly changing into stone. Edric felt that the moment when it was possible for him to hold communion with this strange being was rapidly passing away, and almost shrieked as he exclaimed, "'One question, only one, ere it be too late!' The mummy feebly raised his languid eyelids, but Edric felt his blood freeze at the unnatural glare. With a violent effort, however, he roused himself to speak. "'Was it a human power that dragged you from the tomb?' "'The power that gave me life could alone restore it,' replied the mummy in slow, measured accents, as it sank gradually back into its former tomb. Edric shuddered and involuntarily rushed forward, but the mummy no longer lived or breathed. Cold, pale, and inanimate it lay as though its sleep of three thousand years had never been broken oblivion laid him down upon its hairs and no mortal could ever more boast of holding converse with the mummy end of chapter eight of volume three end of the mummy a tale of the twenty-second century by jane loudon